You may have come across the teachings of traditionalist Sadiva Cantist Rochester monks known as the Diamond Brothers, who claim that the Papal See has been vacant for decades due to what they see as the heretical nature of the Vatican II Council Revolution. They argue that no heretic can hold the position of Pope. In their arguments, they often reference an encyclical called Mirari Vos, specifically paragraph 13, where Pope Gregory XVI condemns a concept known as religious indifferentism. Gregory defines this as a dangerous belief propagated by those who claim that salvation can be achieved through the profession of any religion, as long as one maintains moral behavior. Gregory goes on to quote the Athanasian Creed stating that individuals will face eternal damnation unless they hold the Catholic faith in its entirety. It's important to note that this stance is not in line with the current position of the Vatican led by Francis. Francis has been accused of religious indifferentism, and this is evident in a particular video where a young boy publicly asks if his deceased atheist father made it to heaven, despite not accepting the Roman Catholic faith. Poco tempo fa è mancato, viene, è venuto a mancare mio papà. Lui era ateo. E in cielo, papà? Voi pensate che Dio sarebbe capace di lasciarlo lontano da te? Pensate quello? Ma forte, con coraggio. Dio abbandona i suoi figli? Dio abbandona i suoi figli quando sono bravi? Ecco, Emanuele. In his response, Francis appears to clearly indicate that the Father did indeed find a place in heaven without adhering to the Roman faith. Supporters of the Vatican II Church have employed various tactics to shape the narrative and discourage people from seeking the truth about the current state of affairs in Rome. You may have heard that the apostasy in Rome is explicitly mentioned in the Third Secret of Fatima. Father Malachi Martin, who served as an assistant to two papal claimants, affirmed this in radio interviews. He had knowledge of the Third Secret, distinct from the version released by the Vatican on June 26, 2000, as he had read the one-page Secret of Fatima, a text believed to be given by heaven. Um, this as well. Please ask the Father to tell us anything he can, or he's willing to, about the prophecy of Fatima. The prophecy of Fatima, uh, without going into my background in this matter, um, the prophecy of Fatima is not a pleasant document to read. Uh, there's not pleasant news. It implies, it doesn't make any sense unless we accept that there will be, or that there is in progress, a wholesale apostasy amongst clerics and laity in the Catholic Church that the institutional organization of the Roman Catholic Church, that is the, the, the organization of parishes, dioceses, archbishops and bishops and cardinals and uh, the Roman bureaucracies and the chanceries throughout the world, um, unless that is totally disrupted and rendered null and void, the third secret makes no sense. And number two, uh, the other salient characteristic about it is uh, that it means intense suffering. I don't know what the believers. I don't know what the third secret is, Father. The third secret, Lucia, Sister Lucia, who's still alive, the only surviving child of the three Fatima children. She's 89 now. She lives in Coimbra, in the Carmelite convent in Spain. She was prevailed upon by her bishop to write down the third secret, Our Lady conveyed two secrets to the children. We know the first two, but the third secret, uh, she, uh, Lucia, since she was the only survivor, refused to tell anybody. And finally the bishop said, look, uh, we're all getting on in age, sister, write it down, and we'll send it over to the Pope. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it's not destined for the Pope, it's destined for the people. Well, if the Pope will tell the people about it. So she wrote it down. And, uh, and then in the 50s, it was conveyed over to Rome to Pius XII, Pope Pius XII, and Cardinal Ottaviani, who was the head of the Holy Office of that time. They put it away because Lucia said that it shouldn't be opened except by the Pope in 1960, because the thing would be clear then. 
So it was opened by John the Twenty Third in February 1960, and he proceeded to say that it wasn't true. It was unreliable, and the children didn't know what they were talking about. And Lucia didn't because when she got this supposed secret from the Virgin, uh, she was illiterate and she was under 10 years old, so she couldn't know what she was talking about. And John Twenty Third, uh, then in his opening speech at the Vatican Council on uh, October 11, 1962, referred contemptuously to the three children as prophets of doom and said, we, we today, we don't, need, we don't need, have anything to do with these prophets of doom because uh, we are in a different age. And so he suppressed the secret. And, and it remains so today? It remains so today. And it's uh, Paul VI read it, Pope Paul VI, and did nothing about it. John Paul I read it, did nothing about it. And John Paul II has read it twice and has done nothing about it. He has spoken about it in public, but he has done nothing about it. And that's the status of the secret today. Um, do you do you do you know what it is? Yes, but I'm under oath. Do you consider um, do you consider it to be the ravings of a uh, illiterate uh, child? No, no. It's a very exact description of what is now happening and apparently what is going to happen shortly, but in cold, hard terms. There's no. There's no exaggeration, there's no use of adjectives or adverbs or anything like that. It's a blanket statement, uh, a very factual thing, stated baldly, uh, with no adulteration, no flourishes, no purple patches. In other right. words, they got exactly what they asked for. Yeah, it's a frightening document. It's very frightening. All right, I promise to go to the lines. Yeah. West of the Rock. In specific radio interviews discussing the third secret, Malachy Martin explicitly suggested that the papal chair would be vacant or overtaken by a non-Catholic figure, leading a false, secularized church. Meanwhile, the true pope might operate in obscurity along with a church with reduced visibility. Now, what is the future? The future is a diminishing socio-political and socio-cultural effect of Catholics, the dispelling of anything like a potent Catholic community and the uh, existence of Catholicism in its traditional form underground in the sense that it's private and practiced uh, quasi in secret and out of the public view because the public doesn't like it. Hmm. Uh, and there will always be, well, not always, but there will be for quite a long time a public facade uh, in which there is, uh, there, is, there is a group of officials, bishops, priests, uh, all the way up to the papacy, who will maintain the exterior facade, but the power will be gone. Interestingly enough, the future of the papacy is different because of the power that the papacy exerts as a center. But that's, that's a wider question. Yeah, you know, it will be. You're saying it will be different, or is different in. It, it will. It really will belong to the mainstream. There will be very little difference between it and the other component members of the socio-political body. Are you suggesting the Pope has been reduced to nothing much more than a figurehead? Yes, I am. That is what I am saying, and that is the fact. That is in the actual effect on politics and on culture. Malachy Martin himself described the text he read as a one-sheet text, not a four-sheets text. A historian named Paul Kramer in the book The Devil's Final Battle emphasized the existence of a one-sheet text that differs from the four-sheet version. This information finds support from reputable sources such as Canon Galamba, a priest closely associated with Sister Lucia, the seer of Fatima who transcribed the secret. Although Canon Galamba didn't explicitly refer to a four-sheet text to my knowledge, he certainly acknowledged the existence of a one-sheet text, as explained by Kramer. Well, I'm not sure preamble was the right Yeah, oh, There is no introductory um, uh, statement in the actual secret, the text, actual text of the secret itself. So you don't recognize what I just read? Not as a part of that one 
sheet of paper. No, but it may well be that what follows Furthermore, despite the Diamond Brothers and their followers' claim that the four-sheet text is a forgery, its credibility was seemingly corroborated by a well-known high-ranking post-Vatican II-era clergyman, Loris Francesco Capovilla, an assistant to John III and III when the Third Secret was initially unveiled. Antonio Sochi details this in The Fourth Secret of Fatima. The Diamond Brothers criticized the theological content of the four-sheet text without definitive proof, while a follower of theirs, Christian Truth, discredited it based on Capovilla's lack of credibility. However, this isn't a conclusive argument against the four-sheet text. Additionally, Fatima researcher Dr. Peter Chonowski, Ph.D., found that forensic analysis confirmed the handwriting of the four-sheet text to be consistent with Sister Lucia's verified handwriting. And it's also important where the third secret was hijacked by the Vatican in 2000, because what was presented, even though, and see, this is, this proves, this proves that we are, that Sister Lucy Truth is perfectly upfront and desired objective answers to these questions, because we submitted the Vatican, what the Vatican released, which, which was supposedly the third secret, we submitted it to our handwriting analyst, and he said it was authentic. It matched the writing of the earlier sister Lucy and her memoirs, which I didn't expect. Hmm. But it leads me to think because that it's a vision that she recorded clearly, but there's clearly something missing or there's some kind of deflection or distortion going on because that's clearly not the type of thing that was expected by the world right. and reported by everyone else. Um, the, the third secret was supposed to be 20. The Diamond Brothers and their supporters accepted this kind of handwriting analysis as valid evidence criterion for Sister Lucia's authorship, rejecting on this account some of her later attributed handwriting as false from forensic analysis. Hence, the illegitimacy of the four-sheet text remains unsubstantiated. Additionally, Canon Galamba, who spoke about the one-sheet third secret, was the individual who initially proposed to Sister Lucia, or at least to Bishop José da Silva, that she should transcribe the third secret. This proposal was made in a public academic setting where both Sister Lucia and Bishop José da Silva were present. This incident is noted by historian Friar Michel de la Sainte Trinité in his work on Fatima. The indication from Malachi Martin, essentially suggesting that the third secret predicts a sede vacante, the faithful without a pope temporarily, and a false church ruled by an anti-pope, aligns with statements from other reputable sources who claim to have knowledge of the third secret. Now, what is the future? The future is a diminishing socio-political and socio-cultural effect of Catholics, the dispelling of anything like a potent Catholic community and the uh, existence of Catholicism in its traditional form underground in the sense that it's private and practiced uh, quasi in secret and out of the public view because the public doesn't like it. Uh, and there will always be, well, not always, but there will be for quite a long time a public facade uh, in which there is, uh, there, is, there is a group of officials, bishops, priests, uh, all the way up to the papacy, who will maintain the exterior facade, but the power will be gone. 93, and well into May, June, and July of that year, I don't think you would ever speak to me again, because I would have let you down. I wouldn't have brought to your notice what I think is fatally necessary for every Catholic to know, and that is the fate of the papacy and the coming stress and danger and that we shall be without the strength of the papacy. Now let me explain what I'm talking about. 
However, this particular information doesn't sit well with some public figures and supporters of the Vatican II Church. That's why Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon, recognized as conservative-leaning supporters of the Vatican II Church, created a video discrediting Malachi Martin by resorting to personal attacks. Their critique against Martin includes accusations of breaching his clerical oath of celibacy, alleging his involvement in sexual transgressions, along with proposed evidence of doctrinal deviations. These deviations contrast with Martin's more widely known late publications, suggesting a shift from the perspectives presented in his later works. And wanted to find out what the story is. And, and she told him Malachi was going to get laicized to marry her. It, it obviously never happened. Which allegedly he told, he, he was a serial liar and he told a, a slew of women something similar, uh, right. according to his, the his, set of contest. His brother allegedly said that this happened with four women. Mm -hmm. And maybe a guy. Did you catch that detail? Yeah, he said no. four women and maybe a man. <laughs> a man <laughs> might have slipped in there one way or another. There's no way to know. During the final years of his life in the 90s, Malachi Martin engaged in seven interviews with Art Bell. In these interviews, he seemingly, albeit indirectly, acknowledged personal challenges related to his vow of celibacy. Additionally, Martin spoke about what he termed as a moral and doctrinal corruption, likened to a sunset pervading humanity without excluding himself. He essentially linked this sunset to information confirmed by the third secret of Fatima. However, Martin's associate Bernard Janssen made an important observation about the allegations regarding Martin's supposed breach of clerical celibacy. Janssen, who had the first-hand experience of living in close proximity to Martin for a considerable period, found it highly improbable that Father Malachi Martin would have remained unrepentant. Janssen believed that Martin was acutely conscious of the seriousness of such a state and had consistent opportunities to confess any transgressions sacramentally to trusted priests. Observing Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon's video critiquing Malachi Martin, it's evident that Martin's remarks on the Third Secret and the state of the Catholic Church deeply affected Marshall and Gordon. The impact of Martin's words seemed to strike a nerve, prompting an intense and seemingly emotional reaction from them. An evident facet of this emotional response, somewhat predictable in terms of moral attitudes but not entirely forgivable, appears in the attempt to subject Malachi Martin to psychological scrutiny. This effort aims to reduce Martin's genuine concern about the third secret, its grave predictions and the harm caused by withholding the text, to a mere pretense existing solely within Martin's mind. From their standpoint, the entire narrative of suspicion or unease against the clerical authorities of the post-Vatican II Church, as well as the apprehension about the course of events according to the Third Secret, depicted and discussed by Malachi Martin, is attributed not to the objective reality and the content of the Third Secret. Instead, it's ascribed to Malachi Martin himself, particularly his perceived opportunistic state of mind and personal character. Uh, the milk That's honey. right. So if you're if he meets uh a Jew from New York City, he can start talking about rabbis and ones he knew in the Middle East and Rome and all that. The Nostra Aetate, yeah, what it book, means. Cardinal Bea's input, Paul VI, how he went with Paul VI. And then if he meets a trad, well, then he figures you out. He's like talking about exorcists. He's talking about, you know, problems of the council, guilty cardinals. So he's got right. his, his toolbox. He just figures out who he's talking to and adjusts accordingly. Yeah, if you're a liar and you're pretty swift, it's not that hard to do. Like, the other really stark thing that always made me suspicious of Malachi Martin, even in moments I've had where I kind of wanted to believe all, you know, the the uh, the limerick charm that is Malachi Martin. Yes. Is what what why why not reveal, dude? You're saying you're pro revelation of the third secret. You're on board for it was supposed to be revealed in 1960. There is 3B, the, the existence of 3B is real, it's extant, right. and it's and a great di disobedience, by the way. Why not tell us, dude? He'd be like, no, I can only kind of hint. He's like, right. he's making it up on the spot. By the way, I mean, he's, also, he's also a smarty pants, so the fact that he, 
I guess you and I both believe was making up what he was saying to Art Bell. Does it doesn't? I mean, he he might have been able to reason to it a priori. It's not that tough, you know. It's sure. not that tough to reason to what it probably meant. He still might be right. Marshall and Gordon's primary argument against Malachi Martin's assertions concerning the third secret is rooted in their belief that Martin's claims were driven by his deceitful and self-serving intentions. They contend that Martin's statements or allegations concerning the third secret of Fatima were outright falsehoods. In essence, they assert that Malachi Martin was entirely a deceiver and a liar regarding the third secret. Their response to this matter has been to attempt to analyze Martin's psychological motivations, attributing insufficient objective or substantial reality to his position on the third secret. In the realm of historical claims and secrets, the truth is often shrouded in layers of mystery and misrepresentation. One such case involves Malachi Martin, a figure entangled in the enigmatic whispers of the third secret of Fatima. A narrative has been spun, suggesting Martin merely overheard the secret, casting a shadow of doubt over his credibility. Makes Malachi Martin so famous in right. Catholic circles, it's this claim, whether it's true or not, that either he was in the room or he was in the hallway, his bedroom was nearby, he overheard what was read in the third secret of Fatima on that fateful day in 1959, when John the 23rd said, allegedly, this is not, uh, this is not for my pontificate. Not for my pontificate. Yeah. yeah. Which is a weird thing to overhear. I mean, if, if it's this secret, the fate of the like, world. Was he bringing in balance. like cappuccinos and like, you yeah, exactly. talking like back, back out into the hallway yeah. and like, listen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. What, what do you mean? And he, the, he'll never, specify whether he's bringing cappuccinos or whether it was bagels or a little right. frittata or what. Right. And, and, and even when you go listen to the Art Bell interviews, he kind of asks him about it. And one of them, he's like, okay, so you, you overheard, like, he was kind of trying to say nicely, like, dude, were you eavesdropping? Or this is super secret. This is a big deal. Right. And you overheard. And he's kind of just like, he, he, he breezes past it. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I overheard it. And uh, then he starts talking about what, he says they mean he still might be right i just don't think he overheard it carrying a tray right. of cappuccinos right maybe he did maybe even if he did he never told us what it was so it's a little bit irrelevant to give these like babyish hints and it's like mm -hmm. come on dude is this real or not Sa right. same thing with like all the stuff he claimed to know yet the tapestry of facts weaves a different picture malachi martin himself was clear he had not eavesdropped on sacred whispers but had read the third secret directly a single sheet of paper handed to him by Cardinal B bore the weight of the secret's words. Martin, bound by an oath of silence, never once deviated from his claim of direct access throughout his interviews with Art Bell. He was not a distant listener, but a chosen confidant, entrusted with knowledge meant for few eyes. Father, in what manner were you shown the third secret? Because the Cardinal who showed it to me had been present at a meeting held by Pope John XXIII uh, in that year, 1960. That's roughly the third secret. Now, what's the third secret? It's rather a dire document, uh, ma'am. It's not pleasant reading at all. Uh, I'm under oath not to reveal the actual details of it because I read it. You read it? I read it. I, I, I can't break my oath in that matter, but it is not pleasant reading at all. Does this involve a chastisement? Yes. Several. Several. All right, there. Despite the clarity of Martin's account, a cloud of misinformation lingers. Taylor Marshall's video, which misrepresents Martin's experience, remains uncorrected even in the face of viewers' comments pointing out the inaccuracy. No retraction, no amendment, just silence. This silence speaks volumes, leaving the misrepresentation unaddressed and the truth of Malachi Martin's claim obscured by a veil of neglect. It's a stark reminder that in the pursuit of truth, vigilance is key, and the responsibility to correct misinformation is paramount. It does appear that Taylor Marshall has not taken any action to address the discrepancy between the actual claim made by Malachi Martin regarding the third secret and what was portrayed in his video. The persistence of this portrayal, despite contrary information being brought up in the comments, can indeed raise suspicions or at least intrigue as to why this discrepancy has not been acknowledged or rectified.
The likelihood of both video commentators reaching the same incorrect conclusion regarding Malachi Martin's assertion, assuming their position on this matter is incorrect, suggests either a shared misinterpretation or a lack of detailed research into the specifics of Malachi Martin's statements. It's indeed curious that both commentators have arrived at the same incorrect understanding, especially when the actual information available contradicts their assertions about Malachi Martin overhearing the secret. This raises questions about the accuracy of their statements and the extent of their research or understanding on this particular aspect of Malachi Martin's claims. It appears that there are significant inconsistencies and contradictions in the stances and actions of both Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon. The Diamond Brothers, in their video titled Taylor Marshall's Publicity Stunts and False Theology Exposed, linked in the video description, provide recorded statements from Marshall demonstrating his ability and admitted practice of manipulating public perceptions by orchestrating simulations. Marshall's involvement in orchestrating the event of dumping the Pachamama icons into the Tiber River during the Synod of the Amazon, followed by an interview with the same individual involved in the act, as if Marshall was a mere a spectator of the event acting as a journalist, was presented as a strategic move to bolster Marshall's image and credibility, suggesting a pattern of calculated actions to increase influence and viewership. And we also saw it was an opportunity for, you know, Cardinal Mueller went on EWTN and praised it, Cardinal Brandmiller praised it, Schneider praised it. I mean, we saw people come out and rally, even though we didn't know your name, we didn't know your face. We saw people come out and take a stand and say, we, idols in church is a step too far. Timothy Gordon, in contrast, exhibited a similar form of duplicity. After previously aligning himself with Marshall in a negative assessment of Malachi Martin's character and credibility in their shared video, Malachi Martin, can we trust him, plus sedevacantism, Gordon later released a video around October 2022 titled Four Things Malachi Martin Got Right. I'll be talking about four things that Malachi Martin, author of this book, Windswept House, and many others, most definitely got right. The topic is relevant because so many people down through the last three decades of Roman Catholic recent history have accused him of being a phenomenal, fantastical liar. I used to buy into this more. This shift in Gordon's stance suggests an inconsistency or change in perspective, particularly considering that he later acknowledged Martin's accurate understanding of Cardinal Joseph Bernardin in the novel Windswept House as a dangerous criminal and Satanist. An in-depth church militant investigation has turned up a career-long track record of accusations against former Chicago Cardinal Joseph Bernadine that not only was he a homo predator his entire career, but that at various stops in his career, many of those sexual assaults were tied to satanic rituals. Current Cardinal Blaise Supich has reported none of this to the Illinois Attorney General deliberately covering up at least one serious allegation. Wait. Bernadine was ordained in April of 1952 by his bishop in Charleston, South Carolina, John J. Russell. In the case of the 1957 rape of the minor in South Carolina we previously reported, the victim identified not only then Father Bernadine, but also Bishop Russell, and that the assault was part of a satanic ritual. Church militant was handed all of these secret files from the vaults of the Chicago Archdiocese by whistleblowers there. In this June 1993 letter to the U.S. Nuncio at the time, Archbishop Augustino Cacciavillan, the victim expressly states, quote, I was raped by then Father Bernadine as part of a satanic ritual. He accompanied Bishop Russell, who was the celebrant. A few lines later, the victim says, quote, Bishop Russell had been the patron of Father Bernadine, and I hesitate to think how many Bernadine has advanced in the church 
and in his brotherhood, closed quote. Likewise, as church militant broke earlier this week, the string of allegations against Bernadine being a homo predator continues to lengthen with the serious allegation from James Grind that Bernadine abused him in 1977. Cardinal Bernadine sexually abused me in Lake Geneva in Wisconsin, right outside of Chicago. McCarrick was there also. And it was a harrowing experience for me. Um, I have a lot of new listeners uh, in Chicago. And uh, sadly, in Chicago, uh, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine has passed away. Yes. And I was wondering if you uh, knew uh, the Cardinal, uh, if you ever met him, and if you had anything to say to those folks in Chicago who surely are going to miss him. Well, I'll tell you, the, the all, all death is sort of a symbol of human defeat, you know. A life ends, and this end, life ended rather abruptly. We, we did know that the cardinal was ill for quite a while. It's overnight, almost. Uh, he disappears into the cold of eternity, as the French uh, say. Uh, le froid éternel, into the cold eternal, although eternity doesn't need to be so cold as all that, if it's lit up by the love of God, and, and, or the fires of hell, <laughs> whichever really one ends up with. Uh, so it's always a defeat always a sense of a loss and that's what we're but the important things are all there all the elements of truth this agnes character now is a well-known or a somewhat well-known woman in one of the southern american states who made her story more open starting about 15 years ago she emerged again about four years ago and, and spoke about her traumatic experience as the victim of a ritual rape allegedly by many many sources corroborated by many sources, led by two very famous clerics, one of whom is Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago. This is shocking. Now, Church Militant has covered Cardinal Bernadine. It, this is not brand new stuff. Let me read to you what Stephen Brady says about it. This is shocking. Agnes and the Bernadine legacy. In sworn deposition, according to Brady, an accounts according to investigators and affidavits submitted in support of others' cases, others' sexual abuse cases, indirect statements to Bernadine, in phone calls and in letters to church officials, and in correspondence with Vatican officials, Agnes has testified to the following story. In the fall of 1957, once again, uh, Martin said it was June 29th, the feast of Peter and Paul, 1963. It looks like it happened about six years earlier. In the fall of 1957, in Greenville, South Carolina, Father Joseph Bernadine, raped 11-year-old Agnes as part of a satanic ritual that involved, among others, Bishop John Russell, also a character in Windswept House, or Russetin is his name. However, this acknowledgement was made years after Gordon's initial critical video with Marshall, demonstrating a stark change in opinion without acknowledging or addressing his previous assessment of Martin. This discrepancy raises questions about the consistency and credibility of their viewpoints and actions. It's evident from the content and tone of Marshall and Gordon's video that their strong sentiment and distaste towards Malachi Martin's credibility, particularly concerning the third secret, becomes increasingly pronounced as the video progresses. Their underlying message seems to strongly discourage any trust or reliance on Malachi Martin's insights, especially in relation to the third secret of Fatima. The, the milk That's and right. So if you're if he meets uh a Jew from New York City, he can start talking about rabbis and once he knew in the Middle East and Rome and all that. The Nostra book, Tete, yeah, what it book, means. Cardinal Bea's input, Paul the Sixth, how he went with Paul the Sixth. And then if he meets a trad, well, then he figures you out. He's like talking about exorcists. He's talking about, you know, problems of the council, guilty cardinals. So he's got right. his, his toolbox. He just figures out who he's talking to and adjusts accordingly. Yeah, if you're a liar and you're pretty swift, it's not that hard to do. The yeah. other really stark thing that always made me suspicious of Malachi Martin, even in moments I've had where I kind of wanted to believe all, you know, the the uh, the limerick charm that is Malachi Martin. Yes, is what? Wh why? Why not reveal, dude? You're saying you're pro revelation of the third secret. You're on board for it was supposed to be revealed in 1960. There is 3B, the, the existence of 3B is real, it's existent, right. and it's and, a great di disobedience, by the way. Why not tell us, dude? He'd be like, no, I can only kind of hint. He's like, right. he's making it up on the spot. By the way, he's also, 
he's also a smarty pants. So the fact that he, I guess you and I both believe, was making up what he was saying to Art Bell, does it doesn't? I mean, he he might have been able to reason to it a priori. It's not that tough, you know. It's sure. not that tough to reason to what it probably meant. He still might be right. The seemingly calm and polished introduction by Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon in the video Malachi Martin, Can We Trust Him? plus Sedevacantism, with the phrase, Timothy Gordon and I are going to talk about why maybe Malachi Martin is not that trustworthy, presents a marked contrast with their subsequent mockery and evident disdain for Martin. This initial statement appears as a concealed insinuation serving to avoid startling the audience from the outset. It seems to function as a form of subtle comic relief, not yet disclosed to the audience, who are unaware of the video's actual tone at this point, potentially serving as a way for the speakers to internally manage their own emotions. The incongruity between the seemingly neutral opening and the subsequent ridicule hints at an underlying absurdity and contradiction, potentially concealing feelings of anger or scandal. The laughter at someone's moral misfortunes evident in the video can be interpreted as a clear expression of such underlying sentiments. But today, Timothy Gordon and I are going to talk about why maybe Malachi Martin is not that trustworthy. We're going to go through his entire history some of the sketches. and wanted to find out what the story is. And, and she told him Malachi was going to get Leia to marry her. It, it obviously never happened. Which allegedly he told, he was a serial liar and he told a, a slew of women something similar, right. uh, according to his, the his, set of a contest. His brother allegedly said that this happened with four women. Mm -hmm. And maybe a guy. Oh. <laughs> Did you I, catch I that detail? That. Yeah, he said no. four women and maybe a man. <laughs> a man <laughs> might have slipped in there one way or another. There. Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon's steadfast adherence to the notion of Malachi Martin merely overhearing the secret builds a compelling case suggesting their potential apprehension or fear of the prospect that Martin had direct access to the third secret. The seemingly illogical and unwavering stance they maintain on this topic implies a deeper apprehension. The apparent and plausible subtext behind their fixation on this idea is the perceived threat the secret poses to them. This is suggested by the emotionally charged undertones conveyed through the clips shown, revealing the depth of the emotional impact on the two commentators, evident in their seemingly irrational responses. The information revealed by Malachi Martin, alongside the insights provided by respected Fatima researcher Friar Michel de la Sainte Trinité in his works, seems to collectively offer substantial clues to unveil the essence of the third secret. These distinct sources surprisingly corroborate each other when carefully examined. It appears that Marshall and Gordon perceive the secret as deeply disturbing and possibly threatening to them, instigating a desire to retaliate or strike back with a sense of vengeance. The unveiling or disclosure of the third secret of Fatima to the ordinary post-conciliar faithful can be likened to a sudden revelation creating a significant impact or surprise, much like breaking news. As the content of the secret becomes known, it can evoke a profound reaction or response from those who encounter its revelations, much like the surprise one might experience upon hearing unexpected or significant news. Question. Yes. If, um, if this third secret of Fatima were made public, if, could it be the shock that the public, that the church needs. It could be, and that is one reason why it's not published, and why it's sunk into a limbo, out of which it's not going to come easily. It would be a shock, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it, it would affect people in different ways though, Art. Um, some people would, on being told that this was authentically the third secret of Fatima, mm -hmm. they will get extremely angry. Oh, I understand. Believe me. Very really angry. All right. The third secret of Fatima has sparked debates drawing attention from various groups including the Diamond Brothers residing in Rochester, NY, 
known for their unique views showcased on VaticanCatholic.com. In a recent discussion on the Pints with Aquinas channel, Brother Peter Diamond challenged the interpretation of the Book of Revelation. He firmly expressed his disbelief that the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation have any relevance to contemporary events dating back to the Apostolic Age. Interestingly, Brother Peter Diamond's stance directly opposes the perspective of Sister Lucia the Fatima Seer. She implied a chain of events detailed in the Third Secret, seemingly initiating around 1960, correlating with chapters 8 to 13 in Revelation. This timeline includes the anticipated appearance of the two witnesses. The specifics of this perspective will be explored further. The ongoing dispute regarding the interpretation of the Third Secret not only involves contrasting views between Brother Peter Diamond and Sister Lucia, but also prompts a deeper examination of its implications, sparking curiosity and challenging traditional beliefs. The Diamond Brothers hold a contradictory belief regarding the Third Secret of Fatima. They dismiss the idea that a future Roman pontiff will be associated with the Ark of the Testament, deeming it superstitious and advising its rejection. However, in a series of interviews with Art Bell, Malachi Martin made references at least 12 times to an otherworldly power revealed by an astronomical sign, claiming this revelation aligns with the contents of the Third Secret. He described this power as communicating directly with all the people on Earth, evoking fear among its inhabitants. Knowing the future doesn't help one's peace of mind, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, I remember I had the, the dubious privilege of reading the text of the Third Secret of Fatima, which I must guard by oath from repeating, but it isn't pleasant. It's I have a whole stack of faxes here asking me to ask you about that, and you obviously cannot speak of that. Not factually, not word for word. I can't. I took a note. But it came to pleasant. And the less you know about it, the better. Except that there is going to be a reckoning and that uh, nobody existing on the face of this earth will be exempt from knowing uh, the power from on high. They will interpret it in different ways. That according stands to, their, to reason. According, yeah, according, according to, their, to their According to their beliefs. That's right, and their culture and their bias. And uh, there will be people who even faced with the, with the certainty that there is a greater power above our heads will say... They will deny it. They will... The no, they'll, they'll reject it. The scientists, for example, will find a scientific explanation yes, for will. it. Many, many people want me to ask you about this. In, in your previous appearance on this program, yeah. you spoke briefly about the signs to look for in the sky this spring. Yeah. And everybody would like words from you on, on this. That if between the end of winter, which is now the end, I think, and the end of this spring, which is in May, roughly and approximately, there is... A, a great abnormal sign in our human sky, um, but something really truly abnormal that makes the whole world stop for an instant, or longer than an instant, then in that case, if anybody has any faith, then take it out of his pocket and polish it up, they will need it because there is coming shortly after that, if that takes place, there is coming shortly after that, a series of events that will try us. That's why I say keep your eyes on the skies, because it will be visible. There would be then no mistaking this sign. No mistaking whatever. You won't necessarily begin to believe in God on this account. You won't necessarily go to run to the nearest church or temple or, or mosque. Uh, you won't uh, uh, automatically make up with your enemies, having been their enemy for a long time. You won't make restitution for your sins. No, not necessarily that. But you will know that a power which exceeds all other power is speaking to you directly. Would this be an event, Father, that the scientists would be able to explain for the spiritually nervous? Uh, yes. Explain away, they, yes. they would say, well... Uh, yes. they were like in 1938. Curiously, Martin's allusions in his interviews seem to mirror elements found in Revelation, specifically in Chapter 11, which Sister Lucia suggested corresponds or aligns analogically with the Third Secret. 
This chapter describes the appearance of the Ark of the Testament in a profound and formidable manner. The Ark symbolizes a significant earthly manifestation of God and the embodiment of profound divine knowledge in a visible form. The idea that this power might be connected to a pope or a prominent figure seems reasonable, especially considering the interpretation by Venerable Bartholomew Holzhauser, a respected 17th century figure who, in a sense, suggested a connection between the third secret and the mentioned chapters. That we have a proper tradition, but it would be lovely to have a manuscript from that time, from the time of Isaiah. Uh, do you believe that the, the Ark of the Covenant will be found? Personally, I do, but I have no, I have no objective scientific grounds for saying so. I think it will be found. Well, as you know, this new tunnel, uh, archaeological tunnel yes, that has just yes. been reopened again, yes, caused many, all the trouble. Yes, many believe that the Ark of the Covenant is close. It, it may well, art, it may well be. As I say, I have a feeling that we will find the Ark of the Covenant, that God will allow us find it. But I, I know. I have no archaeological reason for saying that. Now the sixth period of the church will begin with the powerful monarch and the holy pontiff, and it will last until the revelation of the Antichrist. In the sixth period, he said that God will console his holy church for the affliction and great tribulation which she has endured during the fifth period. For all nations will be brought to the unity of the true Catholic faith. The powerful monarch who will be sent by God will uproot every republic. He will submit everything to his authority, and he will show great zeal for the true Church of Christ. The empire of the Mohammedans will be broken up, and this monarch will reign in the East as well as in the West. All nations will come to worship God in the true Catholic and Roman faith. Now, according to Father Holzhauser, the 10th chapter of the Apocalypse comprises of revelations of the great monarch and the angelic pontiff. Now, I'm sure you are very familiar with the many other prophecies from saints, mystics, and seers of the Church, who also foretold of these great renovators. He says, And I saw, so it is said in the tenth chapter of Revelation, another mighty angel to come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and the angel whom I saw standing upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, lifted up his hand and swore by him who created all things, that time shall be no longer, but that the mystery of God shall be finished, and he hath declared by his servants the prophets. This is the lofty description of the mighty monarch sent by God. He is a mighty angel, for no one can resist him, the envoy of God. He will come down from heaven, that is to say, he will be born in the bosom of the Catholic Church. The cloud with which he is clothed signifies humility, and which, from, the, from youth upward, and without any parade, he walketh in the simplicity of his heart. The protection of God is also thereby indicated, that on account of his humility will encompass him. The rainbow about his head denotes that he will bring peace to the whole earth. The solar luster of his brow signifies the splendor of his glory, his honor, his holiness, his talents, so that all princes will follow his example. The fiery pillars symbolize the vast extent of his power and the fire of his religious zeal. The spread of the church over all countries will take place by the instrumentality of this strong monarch. And before the destruction of the world, Christianity will be preached to all nations of the earth, and this, as this is foretold in Matthew chapter 24, 4, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and Micah chapter 4, verse 2. To this wide diffusion of Christianity, allusion is made when John is obliged to measure the temple of God, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1.
Moreover, in an interview with Bernard Janssen, Martin hinted strongly at the imminent arrival of an extraordinary pope who would intimidate people worldwide. His choice of words in these discussions remarkably echoes his references to the forthcoming otherworldly power, creating a striking parallel between the two contexts. Okay, humanly speaking, could there be one person that would come and restore it? I don't think it's possible. No, it must be Our Lady. It must be a supernatural thing. And she has... Isn't Bernard, let's be awfully frank, even if people don't want to accept it. We know the agenda. We know the agenda very clearly. We're going to go on slipping down the slope. We're a big thing, it's a long slope. But we're very near the edge of that chasm over which we finally topple. And we're going to topple over it. And there's going to be chaos. What they call nowadays ordered chaos. Chaos under control. And there are going to be natural calamities. As well as man-made calamities. Mistakes made by people. And finally there are going to be calamities that come upon us from the hand of God. And people will say, my God, this is not caused by nature. This is something else. And at the end of all that, Our Lady will come and there'll be a sign in the heavens, meaning she has come. And everybody will see that sign. They will know it. They will know it calls them to their conscience. It doesn't mean they're going to be converted. It means that those who are already converted will get better. It means that those who are wobbling may, if they want to, be confirmed in their faith. It means that the others who don't believe and refuse to believe will say, we can despair. There's no way out. There would be then no mistaking the sign. No mistaking whatever. You won't necessarily begin to believe in God on this account. You won't necessarily go to run to the nearest church or temple or, or mosque. Uh, you won't uh, uh, automatically make up with your enemies, having been their enemy for a long time. You won't make restitution for your sins. No, not necessarily that. But you will know that a power which exceeds all other power is speaking to you directly. It's simply God putting people on notice that things have changed. But is it also Christ saying, I give you one more chance? Yeah, it's, 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 it's God saying, uh, there's a refurbishment going to take place. I will have uh, an apostle in charge of you now, who is going to be an apostle, who will have the power to change things. Because he must give the power. And remember, John Paul too, that poor man, Calvotiva, he hasn't been given the power by God to change things. But there will be a pope, a leader of Christianity, arising, who will change it all because he would have the power built into him. John Paul II is supposed to preside over the decadence and the failure and hold things together as long as possible because there are people to be saved still. But the man who will do it is somebody after his death. Not the next pope, but somebody else. And that's the mystery of what's coming in the future. Blessed Anna Maria Taghi's prophecy about the three days of darkness is intriguingly connected to the timeline depicted in Revelation chapters 8 to 13. These three days of darkness align with the final three woes, represented by the last set of destructive angelic trumpets in this timeline. Later, I'll delve into the specifics of this correlation. Taiji explicitly outlines that following these symbolical three days, a new pope will be chosen. This directly resonates with the narrative in Revelation regarding the Ark. This association is significant as it signifies the papacy's custodianship of the Ark's contents, reflecting divine revelations. Later on, I'll explain this link in more detail. It's intriguing that the Diamond Brothers seemingly overlooked or disregarded the prophecy regarding a power from on high connected to a future pope found in Malachi Martin's work, possibly due to their distrust of him. Their skepticism about Martin's credibility, although partly justified given his questionable standing within faithful circles, appears to stem from a lack of thorough examination of his insights. One notable instance of this skepticism emerges when the Diamond Brothers raise suspicions during their radio show about how Martin obtained privileged information on the corruption within the Vatican II church hierarchy. However, this doubt seems to disregard Martin's novel, Windswept House, which details how he likely gained access to this information. In the novel, it's revealed that John Paul II initiated an investigation into the corruption, utilizing the Vatican's intelligence apparatus to gather crucial details. 
Coincidentally, this effort, according to the novel suggestion, aligned with a significant breakthrough by American law enforcement in a related case during the time Vatican operatives were collaborating with police informants. Understanding this intricate connection requires reading Windswept House and grasping the discussion of law enforcement procedures within its pages. This suggests that when the Diamond Brothers hinted at the possibility of Malachi Martin being part of the group he criticized, insinuating that he had inside knowledge due to his potential involvement, it appears they hadn't even taken the time to thoroughly read Windswept House in its entirety. The Diamond Brothers seem to strongly condemn the belief in a forthcoming pontiff associated with the Ark of the Testament. Their standpoint appears rooted in their tendency to consider familiar conventional ideas as truth, while dismissing anything unfamiliar as false. While commonly what's familiar aligns with truth from a certain perspective, these are separate concepts, even if they share a common ground. For the Diamonds, the notion of an extraordinary figure linked to the Ark of the Testament poses a challenge to their established beliefs. They don't feel the necessity to present further arguments against this idea, apart from it being unconventional and contradictory to their expectations. Similar to how Malachi Martin's interpretations of the Third Secret unsettled Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon, it also appears to discomfort the Diamonds. Hence, it appears that the Diamond Brothers' reaction to the emergence of this otherworldly power would likely be resistance prompted by the perceived alien or unfamiliar nature of this incoming force. Oh, there are two things that are very frightening for a human being. The first is to be in a land he doesn't know, she doesn't know. It's totally alien. Yes. But one of the most uh, disturbing things is to, be, is to be persuaded that there's an alien being you don't know now in your presence or in your area. I would do it. It's very disturbing because... That arouses up the good old territorial uh, imperative, as, as, as Robert Audrey used to call it. But it also arouses up this fear of the alien. We don't like what is alien. We must know it. Good expression. Yes. If, um, if this third secret of Fatima were made public, yes. could it be the shock that the public, that the church needs? could be, and that is one reason why it's not published, and why it's sunk into a limbo, out of which it's not going to come easily. It would be a shock, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it, it would affect people in different ways though, Art. Um, some people would, on being told that this was authentically the third secret of Fatima, mm -hmm. they would get extremely angry. Oh, I understand, believe me. Very angry. The sorrowful part about this resistance lies in its connection, as suggested by Malachi Martin's insights into the third secret, to the prophesied sunset enveloping the entire human realm, encompassing not just the world, but also including the Diamond Brothers and their followers. Where Earth could be lost? Uh, I think it can get to the point that Earth can be lost for a while. It will be reclaimed. I think that there's a sunset is creeping over the whole human thing at the present moment. And it's a great sludge. And it's slowly but surely extinguishing all love. The world is really getting very cold. And I think we're now getting back toward that which you really can't fully talk about. <laughs> Malachi Martin's suggestions paint a picture of an inevitable and escalating collapse that cannot be halted but will spiral increasingly out of control. Instead of alerting the leaders within the Vatican II Church, particularly the post-conciliar bishops, about the grave danger they face and the impending divine justice awaiting them, as hinted at in the unsettling details of the secret, the Diamond Brothers have often insinuated that the Vatican II Church will likely persist in its current state for the foreseeable future, seeing it as a dead end until what they believe to be the end of history. Conversely, in both his interviews with Bernard Jansen and Art Bell, Malachi Martin strongly implied, drawing from the text of the Third Secret, an anticipation of the total collapse of the center within the institutional structure of the nominal church. 
He even shared distressing dreams or nightmares, particularly about the sudden explosion of the Papal Palace in Rome. What's most intriguing is that this ominous expectation haunting Martin, which the diamonds somewhat dismiss, appears to correlate with a sensitive topic addressed in Martin's book, Windswept House. The novel illustrates a scenario where John III and his advisors, upon first reading the third secret of Fatima, ask the translator to reread a certain passage in Italian. This moment left the gathered prelates deeply shaken, suggesting a profoundly disquieting revelation. Martin implies this revelation might have led John III to refer specifically to the three shepherds of Fatima, the recipients of the third secret, as prophets of doom in an address during the Vatican II Council's opening. This connection between the unsettling details in the third secret, Martin's warnings, and the historical event at the onset of the Vatican II Council paints a compelling yet disconcerting narrative about the possible fate of the Church. Side by side with that, there's this persuasion he has as Pope that because it is in its last stages, because around the corner comes utter catastrophe for this organization, as well as for the human race, in the form of chastisements, that a new era is going to open. Side by side with that, there's this persuasion he has as Pope that because it is in its last stages, because around the corner comes utter catastrophe for this organization, as well as for the human race, in the form of chastisements, that a new era is going to open. Tell anybody, and finally the bishop said, look, uh, we're all getting on in age, sister, write it down and we'll send it over to the Pope. And she said, well, it's not destined for the Pope, it's destined for the people. Well, said, the Pope will tell the people about it. So she wrote it down, and then in the 50s, it was conveyed over to Rome to Pius the Twelfth, Pope Pius the Twelfth, and Cardinal Ottaviani, who was the head of the Holy Office of that time. They put it away because Lucia said that it shouldn't be opened except by the Pope in 1960, because the thing would be clear then. So it was opened by John the 23rd in February 1960, and he proceeded to say that it wasn't true, it was unreliable, and the children didn't know what they were talking about. And Lucia didn't because when she got this supposed secret from the Virgin, uh, she was illiterate, and she was under 10 years old, so she couldn't know what she was talking about. And John the 23rd, uh, then in his opening speech at the Vatican Council on uh, October 11, 1962, referred contemptuously to the three children as prophets of doom, and said, "We, we today, we don't need, we don't need have anything to do with these prophets of doom, because uh, we are in a different age." And so he suppressed the secret, and and it remains so today. It remains so today, and it's. Uh, Father, in what manner were you shown the third secret? Because the cardinal who showed it to me had been present at a meeting held by Pope John the Twenty Third uh, in that year, nineteen sixty, to outline to a certain number of cardinals and prelates what he thought should be done with the secret. John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd, then Pope in 1960, mm -hmm. uh, did not think that he should publish the secret. It would ruin his, at that time, ongoing negotiations with Nikita Khrushchev, the boss of all the Russias. Mm -hmm. And he also had a different outlook on life, which in two years later, opening the Vatican Council, he echoed very succinctly and almost contemptuously in the middle of his speech on 
October 11, 1962, in St. Peter's, to the assembled bishops who had come for the Vatican Council and the visitors, the place was crowded, a huge basilica, he derided contemptuously the people he called prophets of doom. Mm -hmm. And there was no doubt in any of our minds he was talking about the three prophets of Fatima. Mm -hmm. He was against that. You know, I have a nightmare sometimes. I wrote about it in one book of mine that people are sitting at their TVs looking at St. Peter's and that dome is imploded with a bomb and collapses. I, I have a nightmare that's going to happen. And we'll see it on TV. It will be destroyed. And that would be a symbolic of the collapse of uh, Western civilization as you right. know. And of the organization, the Roman Catholic organization. Um, Father, is there any circumstance under which you can imagine that you would feel free to reveal the secret? Yes. Yes. If there was a total collapse at the center. And you anticipate that, don't you? I anticipate it as a possibility, Art. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I, I can't predict, but I anticipate it as a possibility, certainly, yes. I do. Father well, Martin, as always, it has been tremendous. In like manner, therefore, they all seek excuses. But God will permit a great evil against his church. Heretics and tyrants will come suddenly and unexpectedly. They will break into the church while bishops, prelates, and priests are asleep. They will enter Italy and lay Rome waste. They will burn down the churches and destroy everything. In the realm of religious discourse, the Diamond Brothers stand as staunch defenders of their beliefs, often to the point of outright dismissal of opposing views. When confronted with the notion that post-conciliar clergymen are in earthly as well as spiritual coming dire straits, they are quick to wave off such concerns as baseless superstitions, neglecting a thorough examination of the evidence at hand. This attitude of disregard is not without consequence as it cascades down to their followers, who mirror the Diamond Brothers' skepticism. The pattern is clear and unsettling. The evidence of this mimicry is not hard to come by, painting a picture of a community resistant to outside warnings. Yet there lies an irony in their steadfastness. The Diamond Brothers, so quick to reject the idea of danger looming over others, might themselves be in need of an alarm being sounded, a warning they are unlikely to heed given their history of dismissal. The broader context of this behavior is rooted in a heresy known as Nicolaism, a term from church history that describes the tendency to overlook a decline rather than confront it. padres negociavam cargos, bispos negociavam cargos, é, e toda sorte de, de coisa, absorções eram negociadas, um monte de coisas absurdas eram feitas. Então a, a simonia se prolongou. E também, é, uma coisa que aconteceu muito foi o concubinato dos padres. Né? O Brasil também sofreu, na época da colônia, numa certa fase com esse problema. E lá também, a Idade Média, então, se disseminou muito o concubinato entre os padres, né? É, e toda essa, essa visão relaxada de, de moral, às vezes, é chamada de nicolaísmo. Né? Então, o nicolaísmo avançou é, para o clero em tudo quanto é lado. Então, mosteiros antes, que eram exemplos de virtude, passaram a ser mau exemplo.
Today this is seen in figures like Richard Ibrani, who argues that the infiltration of pagan symbols into Christian thought since 1033 AD signifies a long-standing apostasy. At the core of this belief is the rejection of the idea that religion should reconcile good and evil, a concept often explored through the lens of martyrdom, a subtle yet profound aspect of faith that the Diamond Brothers and others like them might do well to consider. Antichrist again. So you're not looking what's happened in front of your own eyes, really, since even 1033 onward. You're not looking at all the evidence, especially now when it's all in front of you. Contrastingly, the expected role of the Ark of the Testament, or the anticipated figure of the coming Pope from on high, as per the indications of the Third Secret, would logically introduce this unity. It would dissolve the trait of Nicolism characterized by an excessive reliance on convention at the expense of legitimacy, promoting a unity born from faith expressed through charitable actions, rather than just faith leading to undue attachment to tradition. It's simply God putting people on notice that things have changed. But is it also Christ saying, I give you one more chance? Yeah, it's, 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 it's God saying, uh, there's a refurbishment going to take place. I will have uh, an apostle in charge of you now who is going to be an apostle who will have the power to change things because he must give the power. And remember, John Paul II, that poor man, Carol Wakiwa, he hasn't been given the power by God to change things. But there will be a pope, a leader of Christianity, arising who will change it all because he would have the power built into him. John Paul II is supposed to preside over the decadence and the failure and hold things together as long as possible because there are people to be saved still. But the man who will do it is somebody after his death. Not the next Pope, but somebody else. And that's the mystery of what's coming in the future. The Diamond Brothers and their followers have actively discouraged belief in the predictions regarding the arrival of a future great Catholic monarch, a theory upheld by respected Catholic figures. They've even gone so far as releasing a video that condemns this expectation. In fact, one of their followers suggested that the concept of the great Catholic monarch theory should be regarded as derived in some cases from states of ecstatic vision, which, while potentially legitimate, can also be dubious or misleading. This follower also linked the great monarch theory to something coming from a now unseasonable reaction to a Muslim political threat. Diving into the research about the great Catholic monarch, revealed through a book mentioned by a follower of the Diamond Brothers known as Christian Truth, leads to various objections raised by Christian Truth. These objections dispute the monarch's legitimacy, suggesting origins in Muslim political challenges, vague quotes from revered saints and possible associations with pseudo-saintly or dreamy figures. Chastisement theory introduces the great Catholic monarch. According to the theory, he will be a great Catholic king who will rule the world. He will restore the monarchical form of government and convert the world to Catholicism, an event also known as the Great Restoration. The Crusaders being destroyed because they waited for Prester John, who never came, is analogous to the so-called traditionalists waiting for a great Catholic monarch, who will never come. Like the Crusaders, their belief in a false prophecy and a false king has put them at a disadvantage that, unless corrected, will lead to their destruction. While Christian truth endeavors to make a compelling case against the great Catholic monarch theory, using sources like Yves Dupont's Catholic prophecy upon closer examination, these arguments might not stand up to scrutiny. For example, there are indications that the great monarch could be linked to the Vatican-approved secret of La Salette from the 19th century, particularly in the letters addressing the Pope from the children of La Salette.
Additionally, clues about this monarch seem to surface in the third secret of Fatima, as described by Malachi Martin, indicating a forthcoming leader destined to bring about significant positive changes. These details challenge the objections against the great Catholic monarch, suggesting that the theory may possess more credibility than initially assumed. If the information circulated by the Diamond Brothers or their follower regarding the Catholic Church crisis and the anticipated future, including the contents of the Third Secret of Fatima, seems to be misleading or incomplete, it raises the question, what exactly does the Third Secret of Fatima contain? Through a comprehensive study cross-referencing various sources, including the insights from respected historian friar Michel de la Sainte Trinité, also acknowledged as a reputable source by the Diamond Brothers, it becomes evident that Malachi Martin cryptically and explicitly shared extensive information about the Third Secret. This often overlooked information provides a basis for drawing numerous conclusions about the enigmatic Third Secret. In reality, the abundance of information about the Third Secret demands a discerning approach to grasp its essential themes, calling for a sifting process between primary and secondary data. Summarizing Malachi Martin's insights on the Third Secret of Fatima, the revelations can be classified into a few main categories. Ara 1. Widespread apostasy and corruption. The first category involves a pervasive departure from the faith, infiltrating the church hierarchy, from bishops to clerics and even to the nominal pope. And this corruption takes the form of what was described as the smoke of Satan. It's foreseen as an entrenched and seemingly unchangeable corruption, suggesting a divine decree that renders this situation persistently unsolved for a considerable duration. Malachi Martin hinted that this period of corruption could last quite a long time. This profound corruption would render the external manifestations of the church and its administrative structures as superficial and secular, lacking significant spiritual influence in the larger world and the lives of the faithful. These aspects, though not widely known in detail, are supported in part by external reputable sources acknowledged by the Diamond Brothers and their followers. And therefore, when they ordain people, they're not ordaining them to be priests. And therefore, the priests can't offer mass. We have certain cases of certain bishops we suspect have never been ordained, and therefore they're not consecrated, they're not Christians. They're, they're, not, they're not priests. And that means, therefore, the whole thing, the whole shebang is invalid. And therefore, what Our Lady said, that a period of unfaith would come, and the church would suffer, and the smoke of Satan would envelop the church right up to the altar and the sanctuary, is coming true by the machinations of men and the machinations of the devil. Now, what is the future? The future is a diminishing socio-political and socio-cultural effect of Catholics, the dispelling of anything like a potent Catholic community, and the uh, existence of Catholicism in its traditional form underground in the sense that it's private and practiced uh, quasi in secret and out of the public view because the public doesn't like it. Hmm. Uh, and there will always be, well, not always, but there will be for quite a long time a public facade uh, in which there is, a, there, is, there is a group of officials, bishops, priests, uh, all the way up to the papacy who will maintain the exterior facade but the power will be gone. Interestingly enough, the future of the papacy is different because of the power that the papacy exerts as a center. But it, that's, that's a wider question. Yeah, you know, it will be. You're saying it will be different, or is different in. It, it will. It really will belong to the mainstream. There will be very little difference between it and the other component members of the socio-political body. Are you suggesting the Pope has been reduced to nothing much more than a figurehead? Yes, I am. That is what I am saying, and that is the fact. That is in e e actual effect on politics and on culture. 
and your book, The Keys of This Blood, indicated that within Rome itself there exists a super force that has paralyzed the governing machinery of the church, even That's in right. the Vatican. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. There is this force which uh, is, at the present moment, un, 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 un irremovable. I was going to say undislodgeable, but irremovable is a better English word. And this is where, again, one's faith in Our Lady of Fatima comes in, because she said so. And she said that only I can save the Church, because that is what my Son has willed, not because of her own choice, but because that, that's what Christ has chosen that she shall be the one to come and finally and save the church before the final disaster. Because if you read carefully what Our Lady told Lucia, you get the strong picture that things are going to get so bad, so many of the elect will lose their faith, so many people who now believe will finally give up in despair and commit suicide or be taken away by Satan as his prey. So much so that if she did not step in, nobody would be saved. And it reminds us of that awful phrase the gentle Christ used once when he's speaking to the apostles and they must have fallen out of their pants when they heard him say when the son of man comes back to earth he was talking about his resurrection and his disappearance and then he's coming back in the last day when I come back am I going to find any faith on earth? a series of facts which amount to the following that the basic beliefs of Christianity are played down to ground zero and do not matter any longer in the normal life of society and of nations. Where those who are supposed to be the custodians, supposed to be the administrators of the word, yes. and distributors of his grace, where they have stopped all that and have taken to completely secular terms. We'll know it by that. And rather overnight art, as far as I can see, it, the quickening, <laughs> mm -hmm. is such a well-chosen word, it, it suddenly will dawn on people, hey, hey, this thing has gone completely awry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Imminent collapse and catastrophe. The second category anticipates a total collapse of the center of this corrupted institution, where the residual facade left by the overwhelming apostasy will crumble. Martin depicted this as an utter catastrophe and recurrently dreamt of St. Peter's Basilica being suddenly destroyed. He suggested that such catastrophic events would lead to a drastic reduction and marginalization of the Catholic religion. This decline aligns with the hints Martin implied about information disclosed in the third secret that ended up being discussed by Pal VI, similar to the indication of the smoke of Satan suggested by Paul VI. In this grim scenario, it's implied that the nominal church would be without a papacy. These last categories focus on how spiritual decay inexorably leads to the secular and outward decline of the church. You know, I have a nightmare I sometimes. I wrote about it in one book of mine, that people are sitting at their TVs looking at St. Peter's, and that dome is imploded with a bomb and collapses. I, I have a nightmare that's going to happen. We'll see it on TV. It will be destroyed. And that would be a symbolic of the collapse of uh, Western civilization. That's as right. Know it. And of the organization, the Roman Catholic organization. Um, Father, is there any circumstance under which you can imagine that you would feel free to reveal the secret? Yes. Yes. If there was a total collapse at the center. And you anticipate that, don't you? I anticipate as a possibility, Art. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I, I can't predict, but I anticipate as a possibility. Certainly, yes, I do. Father well, Martin, as always, it has been tremendous. Side by side with that, there's this persuasion he has as Pope that because it is in its last stages, because around the corner comes utter catastrophe for this organization, as well as for the human race, in the form of chastisements. That a new era is going to open. Category 3 of the revelations stemming from Malachi Martin's insights on the third secret of Fatima describes an unfolding sequence amidst the decline of the church. It envisions the emergence of an underground church linked to a pope pivotal to its existence and growth. This pope would play a central role ensuring the underground church's expansion ultimately causing a remarkable impact on the secular world. The transformation of the underground church, though initially concealed, would eventually become impossible to keep hidden. 
revealing an extraordinary renewal and vitality. Uh, in which there is, a, there, is, there is a group of officials, bishops, priests, uh, all the way up to the papacy, who will maintain the exterior facade, but the power will be gone. Interestingly enough, the future of the papacy is different because of the power that the papacy exerts as a center. But yeah. that's, uh, that's a wider question. Yeah. The Western civilization. Mm -hmm. That period is coming to an end because this yeah. civilization is no longer Christian and is, the church itself has been marginalized yeah. and uh, sent into a new form of the catacombs. Now, the, the Pope was always first among equals, but he always had that little extra thing called the Petrine privilege. And yeah. that, I, that I think is going to stay. Yeah. Uh, but a modified form of papal power is going to come through because of the fact that the political power, the socio-political power of the papacy is going to be diminished even further. Mm -hmm. And actually, don't you and I know, today yeah. it's a liability to be a Catholic. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, that was just one more question. Sure. Um, I was told that uh, there's, go there's a great resurgence of, of Christianity in Ireland at the moment. No, on the contrary, it's going downhill. It's, 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 it's going downhill. It's going downhill. Well, I was I was told that it's, it's, it's gone the other now, way. It, it, as an organization, it is collapsing completely. Yeah. But now, that faith is still alive, I'm no doubt it is. Faith yeah. doesn't die out as easy as that. No. But against the organization, Shane, yeah. it's in shambles. Yes. Yeah. And it, and. It, but what's the chances? I remember down, hearing down through history, Christianity, you know, the keeper of the faith and all that yes, kind of yes, stuff. Yes. Is it going to resurge again? Uh, yes, at a later on, time, on part of the world, in, an, in another form. At, a, in, in, at a later time, in another form, and more strong than ever. The Shane, here's the point. We have outweighed everybody who came to destroy us. Yeah. We will outweigh this too. All right, Shane? Yeah, sounds sound good. Martin suggests that this pope associated with the underground church will be the figure capable of changing it all for the better. His arrival is seemingly connected to the anticipated coming of the Virgin Mary. From Martin, the Virgin Mary's arrival is mentioned repeatedly and is deemed essential, as she's expected to step in at the final moment. And Our Lady had said she's coming with chastisement and finally with restoration of the church. That there will be a rallying by Mary as queen of all the living and as queen of heaven, that she will enlighten people's hearts, that she's coming in the clouds of heaven, in her reign, soon, and that this will touch voodoo priests and orthodox and heterodox and all the people of the world showing them where they stand and what the church is and who she is and who her son is the lord and savior of humanity we know this the historical circumstances of the enthronement of satan in the church of rome is something else but this is a fact we have to deal with we can't get rid of it until our lady comes with great power because once you do something like that once that happens god doesn't act immediately The authority of this coming Pope will be formidable, resembling the expression of the power of the Ark of the Testament, much like Mary. This intense circumstance will be magnified by an astronomical sign in the sky referenced in the Third Secret, supposed to unveil the arrival of this Pope or power from on high. Martin made multiple references to this celestial sign, indicating its pivotal role. He described the Third Secret as the record of how the widespread corruption's collapse must eventually cease through the intervention of the prophesied Christian leader. Knowing the future doesn't help one's peace of mind, Art. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, I remember I had the, the dubious privilege of reading the text of the Third Secret of Fatima, which I must guard by oath from repeating, but it isn't pleasant. It isn't I have a whole stack of faxes here asking me to ask you about that, and you obviously cannot speak of that. Not factually, not word for word. I can't. I took a note. But it ain't pleasant. And the less you know about it, the better. Except that there is going to be a reckoning and that uh, nobody 
existing on the face of this earth will be exempt from knowing uh, the power from on high. They will interpret it in different ways. That according stands to, their, to reason. According, yeah, according, according to, their, to their according to their beliefs. That's right, and their culture and their bias. And uh, there will be people who, even faced with the with the certainty that there is a greater power above our heads, will say they will deny it. They will the scientists. They'll, they'll reject it. The scientists, for example, will find a scientific explanation yes, for it. Will. They will remember the famous so-called Aurora Borealis in 1938. All right, Father. Many, many people want me to ask you about this in in your previous appearance on this program. Yes. Yeah. You spoke briefly about the signs to look for in the sky this spring. Yes. And everybody would like words from you on, on this. Here's what I said before and what I think still, and this I give out as my personal interpretation of the humanism of our day. It's this. That if between the end of winter, which is now the end, I think, and the end of this spring, which is in May, roughly and approximately, there is a, a great abnormal sign in our human skies. It's not merely the comet, which is a marvelous thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, but something really, truly abnormal that makes the whole world stop for an instant, or longer than an instant, then in that case, if anybody has any faith, let them take it out of his pocket and polish it up. They will need it because there is coming shortly after that if that takes place, there is coming shortly after that a series of events that will try us. Not merely floods, not merely earthquakes, not merely diseases, but something far worse than that. If nothing happens, if it's just the comet and the Heaven's Gate uh, event and that sort of business, then okay, there, there's no immediate pressure of events. That's my interpretation of it. So that's why I say keep your eyes on the skies, because it will be visible. There would be then no mistaking the sign. No mistaking whatever. You won't necessarily begin to believe in God on this account. You won't necessarily go to run to the nearest church or temple or, or mosque. Uh, you won't uh, automatically make up with your enemies, having been their enemy for a long time. You won't make restitution for your sins. No, not necessarily that. But you will know that a power which exceeds all other power is speaking to you directly. Would this be an event, Father, that the scientists would be able to explain for the spiritually nervous, uh, yes. explain away, they, yes. they would say, well... Yes, uh, yes, they will. Like in 1938, there was this peculiar, this peculiar display of lights, which we now know was not. At that time, the scientists said, oh, this is Aurora Borealis. And, of course, we now know it wasn't Aurora Borealis. Um, yes. For the Kaifas, listen or not, is something else. Only God can judge him. Is it true also, Father, there should be a sign in the sky? Oh, I, I would say so. Uh, she said, is it true there would be a sign in the sky? And you certainly alluded to that with keep of your course. eyes on the sky. Of and course, there will be a sign in the sky. All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Mark. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you, sir? Really? This is Ron in Los Angeles. Hi, Ron. You're going to have Hi, to Ron. yell at us a little. You're not too strong. Sorry. Oh, that's right. Go Good ahead. Morning. Good morning, Father Malachi. Good morning to you, Ron. What's on your mind? I have a question about uh, one of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. Yes. Never explained to me. And I have a paradox for you. You said, look to the sky. Yes, that uh, was uh, in one okay. particular period of last year. Y uh, last year, 97, Christmas Eve, Christmas yes. night, a halo in the sky. That's right. Well, no, it was... It was a period from the beginning of spring to, uh, no, to the, from the end of winter to the end of spring. Mm -hmm. There was a possibility that there would be some sign in the sky. There wasn't. Yes, yeah, I saw a halo. Yes, there was, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the sign I was looking for. You, you were looking for? No. Yeah. Does the color of the halo make any difference? I don't think so. And then the sign I'm looking for is not of that kind. Would have been unmistakable. Uh, unmistakable. Oh, no. That's my paradox. What was it? Well, what, well Ron, um, I'd ra rather wait until we will see it, because it will be in the skies mm -hmm. in these years. But it hasn't come yet. Okay. Uh, we will know it when we see it. 
Unmistakably. Okay, thank you. So humanly speaking, could there be one person that would come and restore it? I don't think it's possible. No, it must be Our Lady. It must be a supernatural thing. And she has... Isn't Bernard, let's be awfully frank, even if people don't want to accept it. We know the agenda. We know the agenda very clearly. We're going to go on slipping down the slope. We're a big thing, it's a long slope. But we're very near the edge of that chasm over which we finally topple. And we're going to topple over it. And there's going to be chaos. What they call nowadays ordered chaos. Chaos under control. And there are going to be natural calamities, as well as man-made calamities, mistakes made by people. And finally, there are going to be calamities that come upon us from the hand of God. And people will say, my God, this is not caused by nature. This is something else. And at the end of all that, Our Lady will come, and there will be a sign in the heavens, meaning she has come. And everybody will see that sign. They will know it. They will know it calls them to their conscience. It doesn't mean they're going to be converted. It means that those who are already converted will get better. It means that those who are wobbling may, if they want to, be confirmed in their faith. It means that the others who don't believe and refuse to believe will say, we can despair. There's no way out. It's simply God putting people on notice that things have changed. But is it also Christ saying, I give you one more chance? Yeah. It's, 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 it's God saying, uh, there's a refurbishment going to take place. I will have uh, an apostle in charge of you now who is going to be an apostle who will have the power to change things because he must give the power. And remember, John Paul II, that poor man, Carol Wotiva, he hasn't been given the power by God to change things. But there will be a pope, a leader of Christianity, arising who will change it all because he will have the power built into him. John Paul II is supposed to preside over the decadence and the failure and hold things together as long as possible because there are people to be saved still. But the man who will do it is somebody after his death. Not the next pope, but somebody else. And that's the mystery of what's coming in the future. And there would be then no mistaking the sign. No mistaking whatever. You won't necessarily begin to believe in God on his account. You won't necessarily go to run to the nearest church or temple or, or mosque. Uh, you won't uh, automatically make up with your enemies, having been their enemy for a long time. You won't make restitution for your sins. No, not necessarily that. But you will know that a power which exceeds all other power is speaking to you directly. This astronomical sign was so significant that Vatican officials researched astronomical data funded observatories, and made preparations for forthcoming events. According to Martin, the entire tenure of John Paul II was predicated on the anticipation of this celestial sign. The deferral of this anticipated event was deeply distressing for John Paul II. Well, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, it concerns the Vatican's intense, almost obsessive interest with astronomy. Yes. Um, in Arizona... Uh, the Vatican, uh, despite um, environmental obstacles that mm -hmm. would not normally be overcome mm -hmm. uh, by anybody else, in yeah. conjunction with the uh, University of Arizona, yeah. muscled its way onto Mount Graham yeah. and uh, constructed a, an observatory. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, enlighten me at all as to why they have such an obsessive interest in astronomy? Um, yes, I can, in general terms, Art. The reason is this. Uh, they've always had this, by the way. They've always had an observatory. Not always. It's dates from about the 9th century A.D. But there's intense interest now in astronomy because of the contents of some of the secret revelations they claim were made in this century about the near future involving the stars, involving astronomical data. It's about as general a statement as I'd be allowed to make. Oh, I think I can read that one quite well. Okay, I'm sure you can, Art. <laughs> but uh, there, there definitely is an interest, because they're looking for uh, the evidence they need 
to decide that certain things must be done. I understand, uh, and I appreciate the answer, too. Uh, the, the Vatican has a very, very great deal of power. That's right. Um, we've talked about it. Uh, they have, uh, whether they admit it or not, a great deal of political power mm -hmm. all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they did fairly recently was they muscled, and I, I do intend to use that word, sure. uh, they muscled their way onto a mountain in Arizona, Mount Graham, mm -hmm. and they built an observatory on Mount Graham mm -hmm. in connection with an Arizona university. Yeah. However, the Vatican has the larger part of the control of this observatory, yeah. looking at deep space things. That's right. Now, why would they have done that, Father? Because the, mental, the attitude, the mentality amongst uh, those who, at the higher levels, the highest levels, of Vatican administration and Vatican geopolitics know that uh, now knowledge of what's going on in space and what's approaching us could be of great import in the next uh, five years, ten years. Carefully and well-chosen words, Father. Thank Category 4, in understanding the third secret of Fatima, pertains to the unveiling of the powerful church ruler through a celestial sign. Contrary to heralding a time of peace and tranquility in the world, this revelation is anticipated to echo a similar pattern to the Aurora Borealis sign observed in 1938, which, according to the second secret of Fatima, ominously foretold the onset of the Second World War. According to Malachi Martin, this forthcoming celestial sign is likely to mark the beginning of a distressing era marked by significant bloodshed and violent conflicts. He expressed his deep concern, revealing that the appearance of this celestial sign was not a cause for happiness, as it would precede a period of alarming events shortly after its manifestation. The last moment, uh, in Father Martin's last uh, appearance on the program, uh, he talked about, uh, or you, I brought up the lights in Phoenix, and yes. Father said that uh, if that in fact was the case, something awesome and most fearful would be happening. And the time frame I uh, interpreted from that was somewhere uh, out to spring of 98. And I wonder if he could uh, specifically elaborate on the time frame if he can't do it. Well, Drew, actually, I, I don't feel happy at all about uh, 98, the moment we leave winter and start into spring. I don't feel happy at all about it. Uh, uh, can you, uh, I simply think that things are spiraling in such a way that uh, we're going to undergo severe disturbances, to put it mildly, nationally and internationally. I, I, I think that, uh, if I were to be awfully frank, I think a lot of people are going to die violently. Um, oh boy. I think we're coming to a very bad point, a very bad point, I think. Uh, I, I can't interpret it any other way. All right, I don't even want to ask anymore. Not factually, not word for word, I can't, I took a note. But it ain't pleasant, and the less you know about it, the better. Except that there is going to be a reckoning, and that uh, nobody existing on the face of this earth will be exempt from knowing uh, the power from on high. They will interpret it in different ways. That according stands to, their, to reason? According, yeah, according, according, to their to their, according to their beliefs? That's right, and their culture and their bias. And uh, there will be people who even faced with the with the certainty that there is a greater power above our heads, we'll say... They will deny it. They will... The no, they'll, they'll reject it. The scientists, for example, will find a scientific explanation yes, for it. They will. They will. Remember the, the famous so-called Aurora Borealis in 1938? Well, uh, I, I certainly am aware of Aurora Borealis, but not one specific... There was a specific one, which they explained by saying Aurora Borealis. But it really wasn't that at all. They all agreed it wasn't Aurora Borealis. The only one who put his finger on it was Adolf Hitler. 
And he Great said... Say. And he said what? Well, he was in Bechter's garden at the Wolf's Lair. That was his famous uh, place when he, for, for a weekend with his cabinet. And Speer, Albert Speer, who was a member of his cabinet, his architect, tells us in his second book that that night they all stood on the esplanade of his villa mm -hmm. in the Bavarian mountains looking out to the east and seeing these extraordinary sights of light. And Hitler said, yeah, nun, now we have to shed blood. We didn't shed blood in taking the Tsar, we didn't shed blood in taking Czechoslovakia, but now we're going to shed blood. So he took that as a sign. Oh, he took it as a sign. It was a sign. Because the virgin who told the children in Fatima in 1917 about this sign, she told them it would take place just before the Great World War. She said, um, it will be just before they start killing millions. All right, Father, many, many people want me to ask you about this. In, in your previous appearance on this program, yes. you spoke briefly about the signs to look for in the sky this spring. Yes. And everybody would like words from you on, on this. Here's what I said before, what I think still, and this I give out as my personal interpretation of the humanism of our day. It's this, that if between the end of winter, which is now the end, I think, and the end of this spring, which is in May, roughly and approximately, there is a, a great abnormal sign in our human skies. It's not merely the comet, which is a marvelous thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, but something really, truly abnormal that makes the whole world stop for an instant, or longer than an instant, then in that case, if anybody has any faith, let them take it out of his pocket and polish it up, they will need it because there is coming shortly after that, if that takes place, there is coming shortly after that, a series of events that will try us. Not merely floods, not merely earthquakes, not merely diseases, but something far worse than that. If nothing happens, if it's just the comet and the Heaven's Gate uh, event and that sort of business, then okay, there, there's no immediate pressure of events. That's my interpretation of it. So that's why I say keep your eyes on the skies, because it will be visible. There would be then no mistaking the sign. No mistaking whatever. You won't necessarily begin to believe in God on this account. You won't necessarily go to run to the nearest church or temple or, or mosque. Uh, you won't uh, automatically make up with your enemies, having been their enemy for a long time. You won't make restitution for your sins. No, not necessarily that. But you will know that a power which exceeds all other power is speaking to you directly. Would this be an event, Father, that the scientists would be able to explain for the spiritually nervous, uh, yes. explain away, they, yes. they would say, well... Yes, uh, yes, they will. Like in 1938, there was this peculiar, this peculiar display of lights, which we now know was not. At that time, the scientists said, oh, this is Aurora Borealis. And of course, we now know it wasn't Aurora Borealis. And by the way, that night, that night in uh, August 1938, Hitler, Adolf Hitler himself, was in the Wolf's Lair at Bester's Garden, this uh, secret hideaway he had. He was there with his chief people, Göring and Goebbels and Himmler and their aides. And they watched this phenomenon of light, brilliant light. And do you know what Hitler said? He said, gentlemen, this means we now go to bloodshed. Hitherto, by that time, by the way, he had taken Czechoslovakia and Austria and uh, uh, the Sudetenland, and he was well in his way to be a powerful figure. And he hadn't shed really blood. No German blood had been really shed. But this time, looking at this, this man instinctually, who was possessed, by the way, he said, now this is the sign that we have to shed blood, gentlemen. Was that a sign of the beginning of the final solution? Yeah, it was. All right. In the fifth category of the third secret of Fatima, as suggested by Malachi Martin, there's an ominous portrayal of a showdown between the anticipated ruler of the church and a formidable adversary. 
the Antichrist. This struggle could lead to the overpowering or control of the church's leader by the Antichrist, resulting in a distressing global tyranny. Here we go. Um, just a couple of things I want to quickly read. One from a friend in Australia, Father, yes. uh, who says, I had a Jesuit priest tell me more of the third secret of Fatima years ago in Perth. Uh, he said, among other things, the last pope would be under control of Satan. Pope John fainted, thinking it might be him. We were interrupted before I could hear the rest. Um, any comment on that? Yes. Uh, it sounds as if they were reading or um, being told the text of the third secret. Oh my. It sounds like it, but it's sufficiently vague to make one hesitate. Yes. It sounds like it. All right, and then... Can you tell us in a way that we can read between the lines with regard to the third prophecy. Um, is, there, is there a timetable that you are aware of that cannot speak, but cannot speak of that we can read between the lines on? Uh, yes and no. There is a... It is not 200 years away. It is not 50 years away. It is not 20 years away, number one. Well, that's... And number two, it involves the entire world system. It's not merely one area. It's not merely one religion. It's not merely one race. Will be apparent to all. All, without exception. Without exception, and it will be frightening. Okay, well, I think I've asked as much as I want to ask about that. <laughs> Let us... Uh... But we know much of what is in that not yet published, The Third Secret, because uh, The Third Secret is not entirely a secret. Uh, too many uh, cardinals, bishops, priests in the Vatican have read The Secret, and they have spoken about it with others. For example, uh, uh, John XXIII opened, this, opened the envelope, one of the envelopes containing The Secret, and that mystery was solved, uh, why there were so many envelopes. But he, he read the secret in the presence of eight prelates, and uh, one of them was Cardinal Bea, who revealed the content to his confidant, uh, uh, Father Malachi Martin. And that was in 1960. What is not so well known is that in 1957, Pope Pius XII opened the secret and read it, but it was, it was not... Uh, to be published before 1960 by instruction of Our Lady, so he had no intention of uh, publishing it. Uh, he had some prelates present when he opened the secret, he read it, but it was then put back in the envelope and, kept, and, and uh, it was not revealed, it was not announced to the public that the secret had been read. Uh, and Father, before Cardinal you tell Stitch us... Of Chicago, Cardinal Stritch of Chicago was present there and he spoke about it with the with a priest by the name of Father Lawrence Emmett Hughes, and he is the one who spoke about uh, what the cardinal told him, uh, having heard the secret from Pius from Pius XII when he read it. So, uh, what what uh, Father Malachi Martin said, of course, is corroborated by uh, what was revealed by uh, uh, Cardinal Stritch to Father Lawrence Emmett Hughes. By the way. Uh, uh, I'll get get first the details of, of what what he said. What Father, what Father Malachi Martin said. Now, I spoke with Malachi. And I said, I've done much research on the, on the secret of Fatima. And I believe that in the third secret it is revealed that uh, there will be an antipope who will be a heretic. And uh, Father Malachi replied to me, were it only that? So it's something much worse than just a heretic antipope. What is much worse? Well, that is what Cardinal Smith spoke of to, uh, to Father Hughes. That uh, the followers of the devil 
we're talking about the sect of Freemasonry, the Luciferian sect of Freemasonry. And that's also in other Marian apparitions, approved apparitions, like the Our Lady of uh, Windsor Cecil in the Quito, Ecuador. The power of the sect, the sect will gain power over uh, over the whole world, or the finances of the whole world and things like this. This is the third secret. Malachi, Malachi uh, is, spoke of this, uh, the control uh, of, the, of the movement of capital goods, for example. Uh, well, Father Hughes, getting a straight from, from Cardinal Stritch, uh, said they will gain power over all the governments of the world. And they will gain power over the church. Can you tell us in a way that we can read between the lines with regard to the third prophecy? Um, is there is there a timetable that you are aware of that cannot speak but cannot speak of that we can read between the lines on? Uh, yes and no. There is a. It is not two hundred years away. It is not fifty years away. It is not twenty years away. Number one. Well, that's. And number two, it involves the entire world system it's not merely one area it's not merely one religion it's not merely one race will be apparent to all all without exception without exception and it will be frightening okay well I think I've asked as much as I want to ask about that <laughs> let us uh... it's impossible for us to know what's happening financially because we don't know how the finances of the world are going mm. yeah, they seem to be marvelous and then suddenly you know, Mr. Greenspan speaks, and <laughs> there are difficulties, uh, and we don't know how, what the money is going to be like. There is a quickening also economically, oh, because yes. now we're globalized in everything. Oh, yes. So, so uh, there is a great uncertainty, and we have a great unsurety about us. Uh, but uh, this is still God's world. We have uh, now entered a time economically when literally trillions of dollars electronically flash across the world by satellite, uh, every night as we sleep, right. as we wake, it's incredible what's going on. This isn't the third secret. Malachi, Malachi uh, is, spoke of this, uh, the control uh, of, the, of the movement of capital goods, for example. Now back to Father Martin. And Father Martin, uh, we talked uh, some time ago about uh, three days of darkness. You said it would be dangerous to be abroad, outside your home, or even inside your home. Yeah. Um, somebody is asking, what is the nature of the danger? Is it civil, natural, spiritual? It is spiritual. Spiritual. Spiritual, yes. The, that, that particular prophetic, that particular prophetic fact, excuse my addiction, um, is based on a private revelation which churchmen have accepted, which the Roman churchmen have accepted, uh, made at, uh, in various places in the year 1846 in La Salette, France and in Fatima, Portugal, in 1917, and then uh, at various other places since then. And it concerns the arrival of a final chastisement of punishment from God to purify men and women and uh, prepare the, them for entry into heaven not rapture-like, uh, according to uh, the normal for one uh, evangelical theory, but actually the end of the world. It's not exactly around the corner art. It's at the time when a figure called the Antichrist is abroad. And it's a very complicated issue, the whole thing, but the actual 
danger itself during those three days of total darkness over the earth, the dimming of the sun completely, and no light. Uh, it's a time when the last efforts of the demons to run our lives and to uh, say to rescue take souls away from the salvation that Christ has worked out now this brings up the whole question of the function of angels and demons we yes. must touch on that some other time together All and right. go into it otherwise a lot of this talk is unintelligible to a lot of people not even intelligible uh, but that's the idea of those three days of darkness it's spiritual darkness it's a, it's a spiritual danger in that darkness and um, will not be pleasant God from all the accounts we have. Is the Antichrist alive now, do you believe? Yes, the Antichrist is alive, not active as the Antichrist. Uh, he cannot die in the normal way, um, and he will come forth at the right time. The right time being the time appointed within God's general providence for the human race. For instance, you will know if it's the second coming because the Antichrist will have come. And you will know the Antichrist has come by two things, chief things. First of all, he will be a human figure. And secondly, he can solve all our problems. He will have human wisdom. And thirdly, the last note, which is the most important, he, we will adore him as God, or at least a lot of people will. And he will accept to be adored as God. Once that happens, you know the Antichrist has come, and he's in power, and he's solving our problems, not in a godly way, but solving them. And after that, then comes the second coming. You said, Father, the Antichrist is alive now. Yes, he is. Mortally, as, yes. a, as a mortal. Yes. Well, now, that would indicate to me that in our lifetimes, the Antichrist will mature and will begin his reign the, the, well I'll tell you don't ask me don't ask me to tell you why I say this or why I, I speak like this but um, not necessarily there there has to be a sudden preparation for his debut for his appearance it must come to the point that we are humanly without a solution of some grave problem that has arisen which threatens to wipe us all out which threatens to liquidate human society as we have known it for 2,000 years and liquidate all of our culture. We have very little of it left, but we still have a good substantial part of our civilization still standing. Some crisis that would make us welcome him. Yes. And we say, my God, you are our Savior. You are God. You must be God. And yes, say, indeed. Yes, I am. Uh, indeed. Um, well... During the four years before his death in 1999, it was my privilege to know Father Malachi Martin. Having listened to his interviews and read some of his books, I first sought his advice about the disconcerting changes in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Soon he offered to guide me spiritually. I then had a rather substantial interaction with him over the next four years, during which time he often spoke about Fatima. Another part of the spiritual chastisement which he often mentioned was, Satan will gain power even in the highest echelons of the church. End quote. The strongest statement of this kind came from a caller on the Art Bell Show who said an old Jesuit had told him, quote, the last pope will be under the control of Satan, end quote. Father Martin responded that this man, quote, would have had a means of reading or would have been given the contents of the secret. And yet, he said, the quotation was imprecise. That is because no one was allowed to quote the secret exactly. But even if the last pope will be under the control of Satan, 
were an exact quotation, Father Martin had at other times qualified two prime components of that sentence. The last pope, he often said, did not necessarily mean the last pope before the end of time, but the last pope of these times. Could that mean the last pope before the consecration of Russia? And then the expression, under the control of Satan, can have various meanings. Father Martin used to explain when talking about demonic activity and exorcism that there are several ways Satan can control a human being. He can possess the person, either partially or perfectly. The person could have sold his soul to the devil in return for some favor. Or Satan could so thoroughly control the people and circumstances surrounding the person that the person can get nothing done that is contrary to the will of Satan. Pope Benedict's lament to several visitors to his papal office that my authority ends right at that door makes one wonder how close the church has already come to that scenario. Martin hinted at a possible connection between Sister Lucia's description of the third secret and the book of Revelation, particularly chapters 8 to 13, and the Gospels. This notion aligns with Martin's mention, in an interview with Bernard Jansen, of Satan's animosity towards a mother and a son. It's plausible that Martin alluded to the depiction in Revelation chapter 12, where a woman clothed with the sun gives birth to a son who is crowned in heaven, all amidst the presence of Satan, symbolizing his hatred. Moreover, reputable sources like the Catena Aurea by St. Thomas Aquinas and Venerable Bartholomew Holtzhauser's mystical commentary suggest that the term heaven in apocalyptic context can signify the church. When discussing Satan's aversion to the mother and the son, reminiscent of Revelation chapter 12, Martin implied an antagonist to the future Pope. This foe, the Antichrist, is explicitly mentioned by Martin as a subject of the third secret. Moreover, Martin indicated a belief that the Antichrist might have been alive as a mortal in the late 1990s. When asked by Art Bell whether the third secret contained information about the last Pope being controlled by Satan, Martin confirmed that this concept echoed what's included in the third secret of Fatima. The portrayal of the Antichrist wielding power over the global political domain, religious factions, races, and even the foreseen Pope might persist for a period. These events align with the themes in the last chapter of Revelation that Sister Lucia purportedly related to the third secret. Moreover, Malachi Martin's discussion on Satan's hostility towards the mother and the son follows his momentary pause where he refrains from delving into the concept of the day of the Lord. This biblical expression is associated with the Old Testament book of Joel and contains symbolic references akin to the elements found in the chapters of the book of Revelation, which Sister Lucia connected to the third secret. In particular, Joel's text mirrors symbolic aspects similar to those in Revelation chapter 9, such as the context of threatening darkness and the imagery of locusts. This connection suggests that Martin may have made a tentative allusion to the day of the Lord from the prophet Joel just before addressing Satan's animosity toward the mother and the son. This concept, also present in the book of Revelation related to the timeline of the third secret, adds depth to the prophesied drama he contemplated. So when we read that Sister Lucia said this and this and that, we can't necessarily believe it. Not now. Not now. 
we know that lies have been published in her name. Published, you know, yeah. allowed to tell people, and people are not allowed to know about it. And they're told it's all, it's all myth, and uh, it's all false. And, and then the day it happens, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? What are they going to say in about three or four years' time? Who are the people that are working so hard to suppress uh, Fatima? A bunch, a whole bunch of Catholic prelates in Rome who belong to Satan, the servants of Satan, and the servants of Satan outside the church in various organizations that want to destroy the Catholicism to keep it as a stabilizing factor in human affairs. It's an alliance, a dirty alliance, a filthy alliance, but it's a very good alliance. And look what it has done so far. It has suppressed all mention of Fatima, kept it out of the news. It's so hard to get the news through, because the church will not publish it. And it seems like any priest that tries to promote it runs into all kinds of opposition. He's fired. He's fired. Some of the 42 priests I was telling you about that are now, I'm trying to help, were those who promoted these things. They were called by the bishop who said, either stop this or next month they'd be gone. And they were gone. They were gone. There is this animus, and of course, but let's be awfully frank. The devil, Satan, hates, but he must hate the mother and the child more than anything in the wide world. Because that was his undoing. They are his undoing. And he can't be reconciled with them. He can never be in heaven with them. He never saw them in heaven. He has been condemned, and he is lost. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can. And he's an angel. And he's totally dependent on Christ. And then the day it happens, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? What are they going to say in about three or four years' time? Who are they? But let's be awfully frank. The devil, Satan, Let's be awfully frank. The devil, Satan, hates. But he must hate the mother and the child more than anything in the wide world. Because that was his undoing. They are his undoing. And he can't be reconciled with them. He can never be in heaven with them. He never saw them in heaven. He has been condemned and he's lost. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can. And he's an angel. And he's totally dependent on Christ. In the sixth significant aspect tied to the third secret of Fatima, there's a prediction regarding the consequences of Russia not being consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary correctly. 
According to Malachi Martin's perspectives in The Keys of This Blood, the third secret not only alludes to Russia's role in unleashing dreadful devastation, but emphasizes the idea of Russia being a central source of spreading evils throughout the church and the world if the consecration isn't performed properly. Additionally, Windswept House hints at the notion that during the unveiling of the third secret in the presence of John the Third through Third, Sister Lucia's text highlighted besides the baleful errors coming from Russia, the potential for Russia to extend its military influence dramatically and seize territories in an unprecedented manner, surpassing the expansion seen during the late 1950s Cold War era. The Diamond Brothers assert that Russia has been consecrated sufficiently, particularly by Pius XII in the early 1950s. They argue that since the end of the Cold War, Russia no longer poses a significant threat to the church or the world, neither ideologically nor secularly. However, there are various arguments against this perspective. Firstly, the diamonds previously associated the Great Red Dragon from the Book of Revelation with Russia, this indicating Russia as a threat intertwined with the prophesied Pope. Secondly, Sister Lucia's 1957 interview with Father Fuentes strongly suggests an imminent punishment from Russia following Pius XII's consecration, implying that the act wasn't comprehensive due to its limited scope. Thirdly, Anatoly Galitsyn, a highly reputable KGB defector, warned against perceiving the post-Cold War era as peaceful, cautioning the West about Russia's subtle disruptive influence. Lastly, Alexander Dugin, a key figure in Russian state ideology and the driving force behind Eurasianism, holds connections to communist ideology, having authored the current Russian Communist Party's constitution. His global movement, while seemingly conservative, discreetly shapes world politics, mirroring the strategic subtlety Galitsyn warned of regarding Russia's long-term intentions. A YouTube video from a set of contest priest named Father Jenkins. Open quote, the third secret of Fatima, close quote, Minute 25. 30 seconds onward, has him quoting from Malachi Martin's book, The Keys of This Blood, establishing the link between Russia and the punishments of the Revelation currently, as alluded to in the Third Secret. Be put into practice by the faithful of today and people of goodwill who are in the world today. Well, Julius, to answer that question, let me read from The Keys of This Blood, mm -hmm. Malachi Martin's book mm -hmm. of 1990. Mm -hmm. So I think he says it very, very well. He says on page 630, of that book, the actual contents of that third secret remained by and large a secret until the pontificate of John Paul II. By that time, the contents had been revealed to a sufficient number of people on a private basis, and both John Paul himself and Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger had spoken with sufficient frankness about the contents so that at least the essentials could be reliably outlined. And then he goes in to explain what those essentials are. Lucia's single-page written formulation of the third secret covers three main topics. A physical chastisement of the nations involving catastrophes, man-made or natural, on land, on water, and in the atmosphere of the globe. A spiritual chastisement far more frightening and distressing, especially for Roman Catholics, than physical hardship, since it would constitute the disappearance of religious belief. A period of widespread unfaith in many countries, a central function of Russia in the two preceding series of events. In fact, the physical and spiritual chastisements, according to Lucia's letter, are to be gridded on a fateful timetable in which Russia is the ratchet. The chastisements were meant to punish the nations for their ungodliness and abandonment of God's laws. The whole dire process could be averted, need not happen. In fact, if two requests of Mary were granted, one, that whoever would be Pope in 1960, actually it was John the 23rd, should publish the text of the Third Secret for the whole world to read and know. Two, that then the Pope, with all his bishops acting collegially, should consecrate Russia to Mary. Russia, according to the text of the Third Secret, was the regulator of the timetable. And he continues, if those two basic requests were satisfied, then the two chastisements, physical and spiritual, would not be inflicted on mankind. Russia would be converted to religious belief, and a period of great peace and prosperity would ensue. If the requests were denied, the chastisements would then follow as surely as night follows day. 
Russia would spread its errors throughout all nations. Many millions would die. The practice of religion and the profession of true faith would diminish to a shadow of what they were. Well, Father, Widespread know. corruption would infect the church's clergy. This is the hardest part to read. Widespread corruption would infect the church's clergy and laity. The Holy Father would have much to suffer. A little glimmer of hope existed. In the end, after all this dreadful devastation, there would be a restoration of faith and tolerable living conditions. As though up until that time, the conditions of life would be intolerable. When you, when you hear the Now, Alexander Dugan is a Russian political philosopher who's been called the Putin Whisperer. He's got Vladimir Putin's ear, and he's really influential in shaping Russian policy at the highest level. You are known as Putin's Rasputin, and I've even seen Putin's brain. So he has listened to you in the past. The base of this affirmation is precisely the correspondence between what Putin does and what I always... Dugan, on the other hand, he writes, is Putin's mentor, the creator and guide of one of the wa widest and most ambitious geopolitical plans of all time. A plan adopted and followed as closely as possible by a nation which has the largest army in the world, the most efficient and daring secret service, and a network of alliances that extends throughout four continents. To say that Professor Dugan is at the center and pinnacle of power is simply a matter of realism. To implement his plans, he continues, he has at his disposal Vladimir Putin's strong arm, the armies of Russia and China, and every terrorist organization of the Middle East, not to mention practically every leftist, fascist, and neo-Nazi movement which today operate under the banner of his Eurasian project. Sort through all that. So if someone, you know, if someone says, look, Jeff, like, you know, you're being a fear monger and, and that this isn't really possible. How do you respond to that? Well, of course it's possible. Look, there's, nuclear weapons have been built. The Russians and Chinese have modernized and massively built up their nuclear arsenals. Why? We have not. Why? How, what kind of dynamic has occurred to allow this to happen? The, when you have people like, uh, look, a uh, famous Russian journalist, Yevgenia Albats, she has said it publicly, you know, Putin is, is dangerous. And the, in her book on the KGB written in 94, she said the KGB and the, the communist structures were behind the changes in Russia. She says that, that the KGB orchestrated it. You, you have, if you read the history of the fall of the Soviet Union and you go to the defector literature, defectors, two defectors said that they were going to fake the collapse of the Warsaw Pact Alliance. And I think that did happen. And then I see it's interesting. Mark Riebling, who wrote Wedge, uh, he's a researcher. He's, the last I heard, he was at the Hudson Institute. He wrote this book, and he, he looked at the one defector, Anatoly Golitsyn's 1984 book. Anyone can look at it. It was published in 84. I read it in 84 when it first came out. I didn't understand it the first time I read it. It was after being exposed to the other defector literature. I went back to it and said, wait a minute. There's other confirmation from other defectors about what he was saying. I, I kind of dismissed it like everybody did. And it turns out people don't read. They don't really look at this. And, and so he made, uh, according to Riebling, 140 falsifiable predictions in 84, by 90, which were predictions about the Communist Party giving up power in Russia, the Berlin Wall going down, you know, releasing prisoners from the Gulag, you know, all this stuff. 140, Riebling said by 1994, almost 94% uh, of those predictions had come true. Now it's more of them because he made predictions further out about China and Russia uniting at the end of the post-Cold War period with one clenched fist being rearmed, modernized, while the West had failed to do that. I mean, it's, it's right there in the book, in the chapter, The Final Phase. And it's like, well, there's another direct hit by Mr. Galitzin, um, you know, uh, Colonel, uh, our Major Galitzin, Major Anatoly Galitzin, a KGB officer, defector. Um, how do you explain it? See, the, the problem is, 
all that the people who criticize us do is say, oh, Kalitsyn never made a production that was true. You can go get the book. You can see for yourself. You can read the final phase chapter. It's all there in black and white. You can't deny it. He predicted all this. How? Because when you know a plan that somebody is carrying out, a long-term plan, you kind of can connect the dots and say, well, this is what they're planning to do. Okay, so then they do it. Malachi Martin wrote in Keys of This Blood, if there were one dominant element in the third secret, it was Russia. The provisions of the third secret make sense only in relation to Russia. The geopolitical change implied by the third secret was not far off. Russia was its womb, Russia was its focal point, Russia was to be the main agent of change. Russia was to be a source of universal blindness and error. In that secret, the choice between world peace or world catastrophe is described in terms of Mary and Russia. The reform or the moral defic mortal deficiency of the church is also described in terms of Mary and Russia. Once these categories, purported by Malachi Martin to be part of the third secret of Fatima, are laid out, the Diamond Brothers or their followers may argue against the credibility of Malachi Martin. They might suggest that due to Martin's alleged unreliability, his statements need not be carefully examined or considered. However, Malachi Martin's assertions are notably aligned with what Friar Michel de la Sainte Trinité attributed to the third secret, as previously referenced. In the video, Fatima and the Miracle of the Sun at the 7.45 minute mark, Brother Michael Diamond specifically acknowledges that many of the facts concerning the chronology of the message of Fatima were discovered by Fatima researcher Farah Michel. Hence, it becomes a factual matter that if the Diamond brothers and their supporters view Friar Michel as a credible source, they should logically have no issues recognizing the validity or at the least the credibility of Malachi Martin's description of the third secret, especially if it aligns with Friar Michel's perspective. Several credible sources, such as Malachi Martin and Friar Michel de la Sainte Trinité, suggest that the undisclosed third secret of Fatima is related to chapters 8 to 13 of the Book of Revelation. It's important to note that during an Art Bell interview, Malachi Martin made a slight mistake regarding the specific chapters, but generally pointed to this connection. Yes, yeah, I was wondering, if I read Revelation 12, would yes. I be fairly more enlightened as to the aspect of the third secret? Would that help? Well, Mr. Lucia, who wrote down the third secret, says that the whole of the secret is contained in chapters, I think it's 12 to 17 of the book of Revelation. Okay, that makes sense. There's speculation that Father Joseph Schweigel could have been the undisclosed source relied upon by Friar Michel to link Sister Lucia to the Book of Revelations chapters in the Third Secret. Father Schweigel was chosen by Pope Pius XII to investigate and compile a report on the Fatima apparitions. The reasoning behind this speculation is that crucial information like the correlation between the Third Secret and specific biblical chapters would likely have been conveyed to or uncovered by a papal representative or investigator like Father Schweigel. Sister Lucia, one of the children who received visions at Fatima, shared in a 1957 interview with Father Fuentes that the undisclosed Third Secret was linked to a form of punishment associated with Russia and was anticipated to take effect around 1960. Notably, around that time there were significant shifts occurring within the Church. 
Vatican II introduced new religious directives which were considered disruptive by many. What's intriguing is that in 1960 there was a monumental international gathering of communist parties in Russia, marked by the statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties meeting in Moscow, USSR. This historical event, as highlighted by Anatoly Golitsyn, saw a crucial and long-term plan established by the global communist movement, designating Russia, particularly the Russian Communist Party, as the leading force of the worldwide communist ideology. According to Golitsyn, this strategic move persisted beyond the end of the Cold War, emphasizing Russia's sustained leadership role and its influence on global communism. A noteworthy observation indicating a change in religious influence was brought up by Olavo de Carvalho, a well-known Brazilian philosopher. During a public talk, he mentioned a book he was reading, which shared insights about Soviet or Russian spies within the Vatican II Council. These spies reportedly found no need for interference, as the regular participants themselves were causing significant disruption within the religious sphere, essentially doing the spies' job in causing upheaval. Sister Lucia's exact words to Father Fuentes were, Father, how much time is there before 1960 arrives? It will be very sad for everyone. Not one person will rejoice at all if beforehand the world does not pray and do penance. I am not able to give any other details because it is still a secret. This is the third part of the message of Our Lady which will remain secret until 1960. Tell them, Father, that many times the Most Holy Virgin told my cousins Francisco and Jacinta, as well as myself, that many nations will disappear from the face of the earth. She said that Russia will be the instrument of chastisement chosen by heaven to punish the whole world if we do not beforehand obtain the conversion of that poor nation. The Third Secret of Fatima, linked to the Bible's Revelation chapters 8 to 13, is tied to a chain of events reportedly circling around the year 1960. Sister Lucia highlighted this timeline in her 1957 interview, which contradicts the narrative presented in the Diamond Brothers video about Sister Lucia and the Third Secret. The main issue arises from the concept of peace within these chapters. The Diamond Brothers proposed that the period of peace envisioned in the Second Secret of Fatima had occurred with the end of the Cold War. However, Revelation chapters 8 to 13 only mention a period of peace following the death of the two witnesses in chapter 11. This event symbolizes a stage in the unfolding turmoil where these witnesses will spotlight faith and it hasn't occurred yet. Additionally, the peace described in these chapters signifies a religious and spiritual triumph declaring that the kingdom of this world has become our Lord's and His Christ's. This notion is distinct from what the Diamond Brothers perceive as the end of the Cold War and its peace which they associate with Russia's ceasing to be an aggressive global threat against religion and the secular order. The peace foretold in Revelation implies a sacred and triumphant religious normality, a notion contrary to the Diamond Brothers' interpretation. Venerable Bartholomew Holzhauser, while his interpretation of the Revelation's chapters is not a required belief, offers an interesting perspective. According to his mystical interpretation, by the time the two witnesses die in the Revelation story, the church would have expanded significantly. This extraordinary expansion would occur amid the angelic trumpet's crumbling period before the period of peace mentioned in Revelation chapter 11. The Diamond Brothers' stance is that no significant extraordinary church expansion has happened since the Vatican II era. Based on this analysis, the absence of such an exceptional growth could suggest that the prophesied period of peace, as described in the second secret of Fatima, is an event that has not yet taken place. The relevance of the 1960 period identified by Sister Lucia in her 1957 interview with Father Fuentes ties the punishment outlined in the third secret to Russia. The continued crumbling, possibly even up to the point of the two witnesses' demise, suggests that Russia remains a significant force behind the ongoing impact. The public stance held by the Diamond Brothers regarding the third secret of Fatima might not completely reflect the intricacies outlined in the prophecy. One key contention revolves around their assertion that the upheaval in the religious and secular realms, including the Church's move underground, is no longer influenced by Russia. They seem to suggest that even if Russia was an initial cause of these effects, its role ceased to be relevant after the Soviet Union's collapse. However, this perspective contrasts with insights from individuals like KGB defector Golitsyn, making the situation far less definitive or certain. 
The careful scrutiny of the second secret of Fatima provides a distinct perspective. This part of the prophecy states, In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, which will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. When juxtaposed with the timeline from the Book of Revelations chapters 8 to 13, it becomes apparent that the promised period of peace can only materialize after the sounding of all seven destructive trumpets, signifying the completion of the ongoing destruction. Therefore, considering the sequence indicated in the second secret, placing the period of peace after the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, it's implausible for the consecration to have genuinely taken place before the completion of the seven trumpets and their associated destruction. As these seven trumpets haven't completely sounded, particularly concerning the religious upheaval since 1960, linked potentially to Revelation chapters 8 to 11 and possibly alluded to in the third secret of Fatima, the ongoing disarray suggests that the world remains in a state of crumbling. This indicates that the consecration, as foretold in the second secret, has not yet taken place. In the video, The Consecration and Conversion of Russia, Part 1 of 2, at minute 10, Brother Michael Diamond makes a point. According to Sister Lucia, our Lord will save Russia by ending the persecution in Russia, thus corroborating our point that there is no evidence that heaven ever promised that Russia would be converted to the Catholic faith. In the same video, the consecration and conversion of Russia, one of two, also at minute 10, and in the beginning of the consecration and conversion of Russia, two of two, Brother Michael Diamond mentions, it is a fact that Russia has been converted from its regime of persecution and killing. The era of the Gulag imposed famines and persecutions of priests and vicious persecution of the Church formally came to an end with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I'm about to challenge two assertions from Brother Michael Diamond's video. Firstly, his claim that heaven never provided evidence that Russia would convert to the Roman Catholic faith is inaccurate, and I'll outline this shortly. Secondly, his statement that Russia has entirely converted from its history of persecution and violence is flawed in several aspects, and I will discuss this in detail. Primarily, it's vital to note that the third secret appears to distinctly involve Russia as a significant factor in the turmoil and devastation foretold in the Book of Revelation. Malachi Martin supported this view, pointing out the third secret's focus on Russia's crucial role in a period of punishment and prolonged disruption. Despite the faithful of today and people of goodwill who are in the world today. Well, Julius, to answer that question, let me read from The Keys of This Blood, mm -hmm. Malachi Martin's book mm -hmm. of 1990. Mm -hmm. So I think he says it very, very well. He says on page 630 of that book, The actual contents of that third secret remained by and large a secret until the pontificate of John Paul II. By that time, the contents had been revealed to a sufficient number of people on a private basis, and both John Paul himself and Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger had spoken with sufficient frankness about the contents so that at least the essentials could be reliably outlined. And then he goes in to explain what those essentials are. Lucia's single-page written formulation of the Third Secret covers three main topics a physical chastisement of the nations involving catastrophes, man-made or natural, on land, on water, and in the atmosphere of the globe. A spiritual chastisement far more frightening and distressing, especially for Roman Catholics, than physical hardship, since it would constitute the disappearance of religious belief, a period of widespread unfaith in many countries, a central function of Russia in the two preceding series of events. In fact, the physical and spiritual chastisements, according to Lucia's letter, are to be gridded on a fateful timetable in which Russia is the ratchet. Certainly the evidence supporting the notion of Russia's future conversion to the Roman Catholic faith has historical weight. The account from the Church-approved apparition of Our Lady of La Salette, specifically a letter dated July 3, 1851, written by Maximin Girard, one of the children who witnessed the apparition, is a key piece of evidence. The letter documents the Virgin Mary's words stating the conversion of all nations, particularly following the conversion of a Protestant nation. This context strongly suggests a religious conversion, not merely a shift from aggression as suggested by the Diamond Brothers. What's interesting is that the Diamond Brothers themselves uphold the legitimacy of the La Salette apparition. 
Given that Heaven's message refers to Russia as a nation within the context of the Fatima events and all nations are foreseen to undergo a religious conversion according to the La Salette message, it reasonably implies that Heaven does offer evidence pointing to Russia's future conversion to the Roman Catholic faith. This contradicts Brother Michael Diamond's video statement. The next clue indicating Russia's future conversion is connected to a forecast often attributed to Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, a respected 19th century mystic among Catholics. According to this prediction, she foretold a significant event called the Three Days of Darkness, which, despite the name, may not be literal days, for several reasons that will be explained shortly. After this period, Taiji stated, Whole nations will come back to the church and the face of the earth will be renewed. Russia, England and China will come into the church. It would seem inconsistent for the Diamond Brothers or their group to outright disregard or hastily dismiss this prophecy without careful consideration. This is because, in the past and on different subjects, the Diamonds have drawn upon the teachings of Blessed Anna Maria Taiji as a reputable source. The Diamond Brothers' assertion that the oppressive Soviet Union regime is a thing of the past can be challenged with a compelling explanation. Anatoly Golitsyn, a former KGB insider, foresaw Russia's apparent shift towards liberalization long before the Cold War's end. He suggested this change was part of a pre-planned facade orchestrated within the KGB. Additionally, Russian investigative journalist Yevgenia Markovna Albats extensively documented that the KGB played a prominent role in the changes that marked Russia's transformation after the Cold War. The involvement of former agents from the old regime in the creation of the new era questions the idea that Russia's strategic goals and tendencies have drastically shifted. Considering this evidence, it's highly improbable that Russia's overarching goals have changed to the extent of forsaking its previous persecutory methods. This context is particularly significant in the context of the Third Secret of Fatima, which, according to Malachi Martin, implies that the ongoing events in the world won't ensure the safety of the secularized church post-Vatican II, indicating a potential utter catastrophe for the organization. Well, of course it's possible. Look, there's, nuclear weapons have been built. The Russians and Chinese have modernized and massively built up their nuclear arsenals. Why? We have not. Why? How, what kind of dynamic has occurred to allow this to happen? The, when you have people like, uh, look, uh, famous Russian journalist Yevgenia Albats, she has said it publicly, you know. Putin is, is dangerous. And the, in her book on the KGB, written in 94, she said the KGB and the, the communist structures were behind the changes in Russia. She says that. The KGB orchestrated it. You, you have, if you read the history of the fall of the Soviet Union and you go to the defector literature, defectors, two defectors said that they were going to fake the collapse of the Warsaw Pact alliance. And I think that did happen. You and then the one I, defector, Anatoly Galitsyn's 1984 book, anyone can look at it. It was published in 84. I read it in 84 when it first came out. I didn't understand it the first time I read it. It was after being exposed to the other defector literature. I went back to it and said, wait a minute, there's other confirmation from other defectors about what he was saying. I, I kind of dismissed it like everybody did. And it turns out people don't read. They don't really look at this. And and so he made, uh, according to Riebling, 140 falsifiable predictions in 84, by 90, which were predictions about the Communist Party giving up power in Russia, the Berlin Wall going down, you know, releasing prisoners from the Gulag, you know, all this stuff. 140, Riebling said by 1994, almost 94% uh, of those predictions had come true. Now it's more of them because he made predictions further out about China and Russia uniting at the end of the post-Cold War period, with one clenched fist being rearmed, modernized, while the West had failed to do that. I mean, it's, it's right there in the book, in the chapter, The Final Phase. And it's like... Lucius, 
single-page written formulation of the third secret covers three main topics. A physical chastisement of the nations involving catastrophes, man-made or natural, on land, on water, and in the atmosphere of the globe. A spiritual chastisement far more frightening and distressing, especially for Roman Catholics, than physical hardship, since it would constitute the disappearance of religious belief. A period of widespread unfaith in many countries, a central function of Russia in the two preceding series of events. You know, I have a nightmare sometimes. I wrote about it in one book of mine. The people are sitting at their TVs looking at St. Peter's, and that dome is imploded with a bomb and collapses. I, I have a nightmare that's going to happen. And we'll see it on TV. It will be destroyed. And that would be a symbolic of the collapse of uh, Western civilization, as that's we right. would know. That's right, and of the organization, the Roman Catholic organization. Um, Father, is there any circumstance under which you can imagine that you would feel free to reveal the secret? Yes. Yes. If there was a total collapse at the center. And you anticipate that, don't you? I anticipate as a possibility, Art. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I, I can't predict, but I anticipate it as a possibility, certainly, yes. I do. Father Martin, as always, it has been tremendous. Moreover, the historical infiltration of America and the West by the communist movement led by Russia is extensively documented. Diana West, an American author, delved into this subject in her book American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. The book illuminates how Russian infiltration into the United States began early in the 20th century. Of various authors addressing this infiltration, Diana West stands out due to her comprehensive and recent work. In her latest publication, The Red Thread, a search for ideological drivers inside the anti-Trump conspiracy. West highlights how influential figures such as Nellie Orr, a private intelligence contractor, and Christopher Steele, a former UK intelligence officer, played pivotal roles during the Trump presidency. These individuals, as per West, likely had ideological leanings towards communism and were associated with the Russian language. This underlines that the ongoing infiltration of the U.S. by Russia remains an unresolved issue, not simply confined to the past. In this episode, we'll sit down with Diana West, a journalist and author of The Red Thread, a search for ideological drivers inside the anti-Trump conspiracy. Diana West, uh, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Oh, wonderful to be here, Jan. What, what motivated you to try to find this, this sort of common ideological thread? How did this you happen? See that. We saw all kinds of plotting going on that we were learning about, all kinds of just absolutely terrifying uses of our security agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and so on. So I'd wondered, who are these people? Why are they doing this? Why are they risking everything? Because, of course, and if they are this becomes a very difficult question to answer when you're looking at career public officials, people okay. who um, have tremendous resumes, uh, they head the FBI, they head the CIA, they work in the Justice Department. You really can't get very far outside of their public persona. In 2017, it was actually December, we had a real break in the whole story, and that was by James Rosen, okay. who was then with Fox News, and he wrote about this very interesting couple, Bruce and Nellie Orr. Bruce Orr being the high-ranking Justice Department official who was a liaison between Christopher Steele and the justice world, yes. as we learned. And his wife, Nellie, who worked for Glenn Simpson at Fusion GPS, the shop that created the Steele dossier. Well, Nellie, it turned out, had been an academic. She was a professor in the 1990s, and that meant that there were going to be writings, publicly available writings, book reviews, for example, uh, a PhD thesis, and so on, that I could at least look at to try to get okay. a better sense of who she was, is. 
And indeed, it turns out she is a Russia expert. She speaks the language. She taught the subject. She got a PhD in it in history uh, at Stanford after Harvard. And she studied in the Soviet Union uh, when it was still the Soviet Union. And I ended up putting together in the Red Thread kind of an ideological profile of Nellie Orr. She's my first case in which I did learn, I did learn that she had a very soft spot, believe it or not, for the regime of Joseph Stalin. Fascinating. Terrifying. <laughs> but it, it is, it is that she followed a school of um, history in American, uh, American academia known as revisionism. It is a revisionism. There have been a number. But okay. it was one that came about in the 60s and 70s that was essentially promoted by uh, straight up Marxists um, and the new left, what we used to call the new left in this country, which really wasn't much different from the old left. It was usually their children, um, but they, they took over really the departments on the college campuses. Yeah. Absolutely shocking. I mean, so she was sort of case number one, and, and mm -hmm. you know, it goes on from there, but that kind of gives you a flavor of what I was, what I was finding with Nellie Orr. Um, it always intrigued me. She does have a CIA credential. She worked for their open source uh, shop. So we know she had a CIA connection, interesting. Um, we also know uh, that she took out a ham radio operator's license in the spring of 2016. Oh, right. So you're thinking, who's she talking to? Who's she talking to? Yeah. We, don't know the, we don't know the answers to these questions, but right. she becomes a very interesting figure and very important in this entire well, ex Extremely, movement. for multiple reasons, right? I mean, if you believe Lee Smith, you know, she's very uh, instrumental, actually, yes. in the creation of the Steele dossier in the first place. Um, and now that we have, you know, the IG report that has come out fairly recently, it's yes. auspicious that we're having this yes. interview. <laughs> so we, we know a lot more about how, um, let's say, wrong or false the Steele dossier was through right. and through. Right. Garbage. Right. Right, right, right. <laughs> that, that, that's, right. A good, that's a good word, right. It's been used. Um, so, okay, well, so yeah. you also looked at Christopher Steele yes. in the book. Yes. Um, so, so what, what did you find? I mean, well, I, I know a little bit, but, but tell, tell me. Yes. Well, it's, it, he seemed like the next person to try to crack a little bit mm -hmm. into the shell of, because essentially if she had a little CIA connection, which has not really been fully disclosed, in other words, you don't really know if she knows John Brennan from her past or what have you, um, another person in this group, uh, Christopher Steele, as a former intelligence officer for the British, is almost her opposite number at Fusion GPS, and his, it's his name obviously on the dossier. And there's very little about him as an intelligence officer, given that is not a very public uh, yes, profession. Yes, of course. But when he burst on the scene, the British press were looking at him, and one of the things, first things that came out, he was a very prominent student at Cambridge in the 1980s. Uh, around the same age as Nellie Orr, also went, graduated in the 1980s. Um, and, and Christopher Steele was the head of the very storied Cambridge Debating Society, the Cambridge Union. Um, I believe at the same time, the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was the head of the Oxford Union. Okay. Uh, so you see the kind of people these are. And when Christopher Steele was this prominent Cambridge student, he was known, and this is in a history of the Cambridge Union, he was known as a confirmed socialist. Wow. Wow, right. exactly. And when you look at that, that was twinned with some reporting um, by the Daily Mail that stated that he was also somebody who had CND credentials. Mm -hmm. CND what? <laughs> goes back to that same period. CND was Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Right. It was essentially a Marxist front group uh, that was very much in sync with Soviet Union foreign policy goals to remove um, American nuclear weapons from from Europe, and they were uh, riddled with with actual Marxists. Um, some think there was also support from the Soviet Union of the whole group. Certainly, that all came. A chemical weapons attack, claims of election meddling, even threats to curb Europe's energy supplies. The scale of suspected Russian hostilities towards the UK and its allies is growing. Now, a former British spy who wrote a dossier on Russia that triggered a political earthquake in the United States is breaking cover to speak to Sky News with a warning. There are serious people at the top of Russia who regard themselves at war with us. 
Did you ever uncover any evidence of hostile Russian operations against the UK? Yes. It's not just Britain that Christopher Steele deems to be at risk from the Kremlin. I think they think they could possibly collapse the EU, yes. And what about his infamous dossier that claimed Donald Trump and his 2016 US election campaign colluded with Russia? We described it as a nuclear device ticking away in our safe. Furthermore, it is important to address the Diamond Brothers thesis according to which Russia ceased to promote persecutions in the world after the early 90s Cold War end. I'll illustrate how their position in this regard could easily be seen as misleading, giving as an example what is taking place and what has taken place for quite a long time in my home country of Brazil. According to the late Olavo de Carvalho, a veteran journalist of Brazil and a renowned philosopher, who went so far as to engage in a public written debate with Russia's official ideologist, Alexander Dugin, in the mid-20th century, in the 50s to be more specific, the murder rate in Brazil was negligible. Olavo said once that, usually when there was any murder in Brazil back in this 50s era, and prior to that it was considered a news sensation, everybody would crowd around a newspaper to hear all about it. This changed for as the Cold War era progressed and ended into the post-Cold War era, organized crime in Brazil gained a foothold, especially in the form of drug trafficking. And this claimed the lives of many, especially in the form of homicides. According to a report from the Wilson Center, in 2022, 40,824 homicides were recorded in Brazil, an average of 111 violent deaths per day. This being high, the equivalent of one out of every five homicides in the world occurring in Brazil. And this yearly number for 2022 is the lowest number in the historical series dating back to 2007. If one asks who is responsible for this development, the answer can be at least indirectly suggested as Russia. On May 2001, a criminal of Brazil's, a drug lord called Fernandino Beiramar, gave a deposition before Brazilian Congress, specifically its Human Rights and Violence Combating Commission. As Olavo de Carvalho repeated numerous times publicly and as a journalist, in this deposition before the Brazilian Congress, drug lord Fernandinho Beiramar claimed to have annually and for some time engaged in international drug trafficking. In this capacity, he claimed to import from Libya illegally and annually an amount of Russian arms that allowed him to buy 200 tons of cocaine from the Colombian Marxist guerrilla organization, the FARCs, the so-called Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. After he would buy the cocaine, he claimed, he arranged the drug to be sent to America, the United States. So you have a complex drug operation likely to involve the hauling of considerable loads and bribing of high-profile officials spanning at least four continents. All of the agents involved in this trade had Cold War era ties to the communist movement. Russia, which provided the armament indirectly. Libya, which provided the armament directly and was essentially allied to the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Fernandinho Beramar's organization, called the Red Command, who reportedly had some training contacts with clandestine Cold War-era communist organizations and the Colombia guerrillas, namely the FARCs. It so happens the FARCs organization has ties to the Sao Paulo Forum, which is a communist organization in Latin America founded by Fidel Castro and Brazil's Lula da Silva. Porque o governo brasileiro tem uma dificuldade muito grande de lidar com esse problema das FARC, porque o PT sempre foi um aliado das FARC é, na política de esquerda do continente. O governo brasileiro, quando o Lula foi, foi eleito, é, prometeu ao Uribe que o, o Estado brasileiro não faria a mesma política petista. No entanto, as coisas se misturam. O, o Marco Aurélio Garcia, que é assessor especial do, do presidente Lula para esse assunto da, da região, era o representante do PT no foro é, de São Paulo, que reunia os partidos de esquerda e, e também guerrilheiros, como a FARC, a, a ELN da, da própria Colômbia, 
grupos da Guatemala. Então é uma misturada que dificulta muito o governo brasileiro tomar atitudes é, concretas e definitivas é, nesse conflito. Tanto que até agora nunca nenhuma autoridade brasileira é, condenou as Farc, né, claramente. Lula da Silva's party has high-profile members and former members who received training in Cuba during the Cold War. Merval Pereira, a mainstream journalist of Brazil's most powerful news organization, popularly known as Globo, did once a segment on a TV news program explaining Lula's Sao Paulo Forum organization, coordinates drug trafficking organizations, paramilitary organizations throughout South America. In one of the Sao Paulo Forum meeting, more or less over a decade ago, the communist leader of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, proposed a few compassionate homage words for the then late deceased leader of the FARCs, called Commander Manuel Marulanda. This was recorded on video by a Brazilian news organization called Veja. O Fórum de São Paulo é um encontro de partidos de esquerda da América Latina e acontece desde 1990. Entre os fundadores estão o PT do Brasil e as FARC, o grupo terrorista colombiano. Este ano, o fórum aconteceu em Montevideo, no Uruguai, no edifício do Mercosul, à beira do Rio da Prata. Os participantes são representantes da velha esquerda da região, que amam a ditadura cubana. E, além disso, os membros do fórum, que se dizem contra o uso da violência, ficam tentando justificar a existência das Farc. O presidente da Nicarágua até lamentou a morte do chefe dos terroristas colombianos. E eu quero expressar minha condolência, minha solidariedade para com a FARC e para com a família do comandante Maduro. Interestingly, as of approximately 2022, Russian troops came to occupy on being invited to the territory of Nicaragua headed by Daniel Ortega, who is known to be a Cold War-era communist. In the same pattern on February 2023, according to news agency Reuters, Russia gave the communist regime of Cuba a donation of 25,000 tons of grain to stabilize the local regime. Russian troops are headed for Central America. In a decree authorized by Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega, Russia is allowed to deploy troops, planes, and ships to the country about a thousand miles south of Florida. Also, the decree says twice a year, Russia can deploy small contingents of troops for the exchange of experiences and training. Russia says this training is to develop cooperation in various areas, including humanitarian and emergency responses, combating organized crime and drug trafficking. This is the first time there will be a significant presence of Russian forces in the region. The new Nicaraguan law also authorizes the U.S., Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, and other Central American countries to deploy troops in the same manner. While it's unlikely the U.S. will accept the invite, Venezuela and Cuba probably will, which could mean this is the first step toward a routine military association between Russian allies in the region. Wilder about Russian activity in the Americas. Um, in June, past June, uh, President Ortega in Nicaragua authorized Russian troops, planes, and ships to deploy to Nicaragua for purposes of training law enforcement or emergency response. Russia called this a routine development. Uh, in September, Ortega reached an agreement with Putin to air Russian produced media content through Russia's Sputnik radio network available to more than 20 Nicaraguan state channels broadcasting to the country's nearly 7 million people in Venezuela. Dozens of Russian officials and oligarchs have visited Cuba in the last few weeks, signing agreements to supply oil, wheat, and revitalize Cuba's broken industries. Del Presidente Putin. It's partly in exchange for Cuba's support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
Thus, it is a feasible probable thesis that Russia has been backing backhandedly organized crime and related organizations loyal to the communist cause in order to carry out a persecutory agenda, strengthening its overall strategic goals throughout the world precisely in a context of, sad to say, caring little to whether people's lives are destroyed in the process. As relatively subtle as the Russian strategy may have been from the end of the Cold War era onwards, the signs just discussed might suggest the Diamond Brothers' understanding of what Russia is doing and the position it holds in the world is illusory. In 2023, during a significant meeting between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping in China, there was a noticeable cryptic exchange. Recorded on camera, Xi Jinping made an enigmatic statement to Putin about upcoming global changes of a magnitude not seen in a century. Both leaders seemed to acknowledge this declaration amicably. However, delving into the meaning of Xi Jinping's words, the only interpretation draws back to Anatoly Golitsyn's concept of a potential worldwide October Revolution. This refers to an extensive upheaval, resembling Russia's revolution of October 1917, but on a much broader global scale. It links back to a long-range plan developed in Moscow in 1960 at the Statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties meeting. The notion of a grand and far-reaching vision for present-day Russia is openly spoken about by Alexander Dugin, a leading ideological figure in the Russian government. Michael Millerman, an associate of Dugin's in the United States, highlighted Dugin's influential role as Putin's mentor and an architect of a global ideology that challenges Western principles. This was made evident during a public debate in 2011 between Brazilian philosopher Olavo de Carvalho and Alexander Dugin. Millerman's recollection of comments from the debate particularly those discussing Russia's incredibly robust intelligence services, offers a strong indication of why the media and political establishments in the West have failed to adequately address the influence of the communist movement in today's world and Russia's pivotal role as a custodian of communism. Dugan, on the other hand, he writes, is Putin's mentor, the creator and guide of one of the wa widest and most ambitious geopolitical plans of all time. A plan adopted and followed as closely as possible by a nation which has the largest army in the world, the most efficient and daring secret service, and a network of alliances that extends throughout four continents. To say that Professor Dugan is at the center and pinnacle of power is simply a matter of realism. To implement his plans, he continues, he has at his disposal Vladimir Putin's strong arm, the armies of Russia and China, and every terrorist organization of the Middle East, not to mention practically every leftist, fascist, and neo-Nazi movement which today operate under the banner of his Eurasian project. So Dugan interprets that as follows. He says the Carvalho is on the paleoconservative side of the modern West. Now, modern for Dugan is a bad word. The primary target of his philosophical, ideological, and practical ire is the modern. He's against the modern world. So to call Carvalho modern, a modern paleoconservative, is a criticism. 
Paleocons, Dugan writes, remember this is 2011, have lost the battle for the Republican Party. And they've lost the battle against the globalists. They're losers. American paleoconservatives, he writes, the traditional American right, are doomed. Their discourse is incoherent, weak, and too idiosyncratic. Paleoconservatism is an ad inadequate response to globalism for Dugan. Anti-modern traditionalism is the way to go. To return to the tradition, he says, we need to accomplish the revolt against the modern world and against the modern West, alluding to Julius Evola. Absolute revolt, spiritual, traditionalist, and social, parenthetically socialist. The West is in agony. We need to save the world from this agony and maybe save the West from itself. The modern and postmodern world must die. Only in that way can real traditional values be preserved. The best representatives of the deep and noble West, I'm still quoting, should be with the rest. Oh, no, I'm not quoting. I'm paraphrasing. The best representatives of the deep and noble West should not be with the globalist West, but with the rest, against the modern West. The Carvalho chooses the modern West, even though he pretends not to choose. So basically, Dugan's criticism is this. You have the West, modern West, and you have the non-modern rest alternative. And if you try to find a third way or a third position that isn't between these two powers, like, for example, the paleoconservative modern West, you're fighting a losing battle. It's not relevant. It's not serious. It doesn't have a chance. It's marginal and so on. And that is a big part of his criticism of uh, de Carvalho's proposals. The Diamond Brothers assert that Pope Pius XII fulfilled the crucial requirement to convert Russia to peace by consecrating it to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1952. However, a significant point arises. In 1953, Father Eduard Donis, S.J., openly acknowledged in La Civilta Cattolica that the consecration made the previous year did not align precisely with the request from Heaven or Mary. The request specifically outlined a consecration of Russia by the Pope in union with all the bishops worldwide, while Pius XII consecrated Russia alone, not in unity with the bishops. The precise reasons behind this heavenly request, which the Diamond Brothers seem unaware of, will be demonstrated further. They argue that the wording used in the Second Secret of Fatima implies that the Pope alone would be responsible for the valid consecration of Russia. This specific part of the Second Secret reads, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, which will be converted, and it will be given to the world some time of peace. To approach this, one could consider the prophecy of Blessed Anna Maria Taiji regarding the three days of darkness. If her prophecy holds true and these symbolic days align with the final three trumpet woes mentioned in Revelation chapters 8 to 13, which are believed to be part of the third secret of Fatima, it suggests that a new pope will be elected after this period. Taiji's prophecy also seemingly implies the election of a pope who will be the son of man as described in Matthew chapter 24, signifying that this pope will hold the sole possession of the true faith. His unique sign will awaken the entire world. This sign may encompass the circumstance of the consecration of Russia. It might be intriguing to suggest a correlation between the three last trumpets of Revelation and a three-day period. If you consider the Genesis creation account, specifically the fourth day when the sun, moon, and stars were made, there's a curious pattern. 
the destruction associated with the last trumpets in reverse order echoes the theme found in the seven days of creation, especially on the fourth day. Both the Genesis creation fourth day and the trumpets fourth day deal with the exact same object, namely the sun, moon, and stars, albeit the trumpets order is that of an ongoing destruction, not of creation being because of it a reverse order. One should take into account that the fourth day of the week is Wednesday, whether or not you count the days from first to last or from last to first. The secret of La Salette might indeed contain elements related to the three days of darkness. This connection can be drawn from the secret's discussion of the two witnesses, linked to the notion of Enoch and Elijah, echoing an ancient apocryphal text known as the Gospel of Nicodemus, aligned with the theme in Revelation chapter 11. The secret of La Salette uses the expression Enoch and Elijah, whilst an ancient apocrypha text called Gospel of Nicodemus did call the two witnesses of Revelation Enoch and Elijah. Additionally, an approved Marian apparition named Our Lady of Graces, also known as Our Lady of Sambras, occurred in Brazil during the 20th century in the 30s. This apparition distinctly reaffirmed the message of La Salette by reflecting or mirroring its contents and calling itself a repeat of the La Salette message. The central warning of the Our Lady of Simbra's apparition was about three future chastisements that would affect Brazil. This trio of chastisements closely parallels the three woes outlined in Revelation chapters 8 to 11, hinting at a link between these events and the foretold three days of darkness in the secret of La Salette. The secret of La Salette refers to how only faith will survive or that a lonely faith will survive suggesting that a single lone faithful person may endure when an eclipse reaches its peak. It further describes a follow-up event, possibly linked to the waning of the eclipse, signifying a return from overwhelming darkness. This strengthens the idea of a future pope leading the awakening from an intense spiritual darkness. A variety of notable quotes support this idea. Luke 18.8 asks, But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth? Those who are awakened by the sign of the Son of Man might be likened to Lazarus in his state of sleep, not death. Additionally, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, St. Paul discusses how those who are asleep will be revived by the voice of an archangel and a divine trumpet. This scenario aligns precisely with the context of Revelation 11, especially the resurrection of the two witnesses and other events ending the three days of darkness. In a vision recorded in October 1820, Anne Catherine Emmerich, a typically esteemed nun among Catholics, purportedly prophesied that the Church would transition from one place to another, in a time when it might appear to be in a state of decline. However, she also foretold that despite this apparent decline, the Church would revive. She conveyed that even if just a single Catholic were left, the Church would ultimately rise again because its strength isn't founded on human advice or guidance, the celestial spouse, that is, Christ, said, among other things, that this translation of the church from one place to another would mean she, the church, would seem in complete decline. But she would rise again. Even if were one Catholic only to remain, the church would conquer again because she does not rest on human counsel. On the subject of the Fatima apparition, there's a clash of opinions, particularly surrounding the interpretation of a line referencing Portugal. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. Richard Ibrani, a well-known self-described traditionalist, argues that these words suggest Portugal would remain predominantly Catholic. In line with Ibrani's thinking, the prevailing traditionalist position asserts that Portugal largely succumbed to the changes following the Vatican II revolution and purportedly lost the faith. However, I'm putting forth an alternative view. It's worth noting this might not be a popular viewpoint. I postulate that these words might imply that Portugal is where the church, possibly reduced to a solitary member, the Son of Man, will endure, especially around the time of a significant prophesied sign in the sky. This notion is aligned with a passage from Revelation chapter 12, which relates to a portion of the third secret of Fatima. According to some beliefs, the first celestial sign in Revelation, perhaps signifying the 1917 miracle of the sun in Fatima, could be the initial sign. A renowned clergyman named Georges de Nantes believed the first sign in the sky of Revelation chapter 12 was the Fatima miracle of the sun. Also, the second celestial sign in Revelation 12, frequently emphasized, might be the sign in the sky that Malachi Martin repeatedly discussed around 12 times, 
in his interviews with Art Bell, believed to be part of the third secret of Fatima. People like Ibrani may have misconstrued the Fatima secret by interpreting it as Portugal staying mostly Catholic or having a faithful group when others falter. However, it might imply that Portugal is where the Son of Man will be at the time of his celestial sign in the sky. In this context, it's beneficial to recall Malachi Martin's words about a sunset slowly encompassing the entire human thing, as suggested in the Fatima secret. Portugal, not explicitly excluded in the same sentence, is indeed part of the broader context of the human thing he referred to. Father Caiaphas, listen or not, is something else. Only God can judge him. Is it true also, Father, there should be a sign in the sky? Oh, I, I would say so. Uh, she said, is it true there would be a sign in the sky? And you certainly alluded to that. Would keep of your course. eyes on the sky. Of course, there will be a sign in the sky. All right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Dr. Martin. Where Earth could be lost? Uh, I think it can get to the point that Earth can be lost for a while. It will be replaced. I think that there's a sunset is creeping in the whole human thing at the present moment. And it's, it's a great sludge. And it's slowly but surely extinguishing all love. The world is really getting very cold. And I think we're now getting back towards that which you really can't fully talk about. <laughs> I, I catch on quickly. All right, Father. Um... Contrary to what the false Mary said, the dogma of faith, which we call a salvation dogma, is not preserved in Portugal and all the dogmas. And the site of Fatima itself has become a prayer site for members of many false religions, including pagan Hindus who are welcomed for their pagan prayers by the presiding shrine lector. That whole Fatima is got all different religious people going there, they're all praying together with one another. This is holy, this is from God, the faith is being preserved in Portugal. Tell me who, give me his name. All of us, when we did believe in Fatima, we're trying to figure out how can we figure this thing out? There's nobody teaching in Portugal, it's told, that's false. The key points strongly indicate that those who claim the papacy post the Second Vatican Council, which would include the conclavist claimants to the papacy from Sedevacantist groups, might not have been valid popes. This argument stems from the belief that the papacy is about the growth of the church while the period of the seven trumpets signifies ongoing destruction. While the third secret alludes to a pope collaborating with an underground church and making the church grow until a specific celestial event, the four pages text linked to the third secret released in June 2000 references a bishop dressed in white. Um, this figure appears Pope-like, but isn't definitively recognized as the Pope. The idea that the prophesied Pope will be revealed by a celestial sign hints that any claimant to the papacy until that sign is not the genuine Pope, as the predicted Pope will seemingly be hidden in plain sight. It's interesting that discussions by Anna Maria Taigi about the three days of darkness mention a papal election at the end of the period. This implies an absence of the papacy during this darkness, Therefore, the only apparent legitimate sign in the context of the third secret of Fatima would be the predicted celestial event. The diamonds seem unsure about the reasoning behind Mary's specific request for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The explanation I propose points to the possibility that Pius XII couldn't consecrate Russia effectively. By not involving all the world's bishops in the consecration, Pius XII's actions might have fallen short of heaven's precise directive. The theme of Russia causing the annihilation of nations ties back to Old Testament figures who were ancestors to multiple nations. It's akin to the idea of containing nations within the Ark of the Testament, symbolized by the names of animals that Adam had knowledge of in the Garden of Eden. These names also connect to the tongues of fire seen at the New Testament's Pentecost. This annihilation of nations by Russia creates a dispersion and confusion similar to the Tower of Babel replacing unity with chaos and shadowy distortions of divine understanding. It aligns with the passages in the third secret of Fatima discussed in Malachi Martin's Windswept House. These passages mention baleful errors originating from Russia and leading to territorial occupations, serving as an ominous echo of the Pentecost tongues of fire but in a negative light. Therefore, countering the concept of constructing the Tower of Babel, which symbolizes the spread of harmful errors, it's vital to understand the entirety of what's within the Ark. This content, metaphorically implied by the Pentecost event, 
includes the profound sacred significance hidden behind the divisive and destructive elements represented by the death-dealing tongues of heretics or religious deviations. Presently, these tongues symbolize the anticipated baleful errors stemming from Russia. The Pope holds the keys to access this Ark content and purify humanity's connection to it. However, simply having access to this content is distinct from being intimately familiar with it, as this knowledge is widely scattered across the world. This explains why the consecration of Russia was intended to be a collective effort. Heaven through Mary requested that bishops dispersed throughout the world and collectively knowledgeable about various errors present across the globe should unite with the Pope to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The prophesied Pope of the Third Secret of Fatima appears to take on a significant role that even the collective body of bishops couldn't fulfill, or at least that's a possible interpretation. This timeline corresponding to Revelation chapters 8 to 13 and linked to the Third Secret of Fatima seems to include a papal period marked by growing familiarity with diverse nations, peoples, and languages. The text released by the Vatican on June 26, 2000, supposedly penned by Sister Lucia, the author of The Third Secret of Fatima, touches upon this topic. In this text, the bishop dressed in white is portrayed as appearing in a mirror-like reflection of many people. This evokes the idea that this white-clad bishop might represent the anticipated Son of Man, intimately acquainted with all nations symbolically understood as contents within the Ark. The mountain he ascends is suggested as an element of the great city referred to in Old Testament allusions to Nimrod, the leader associated with the Tower of Babel. This great city is believed to be under the jurisdiction of the Pope's entrusted keys. It's assumed to be the outward representation of the Ark's contents visible to those not versed in sacred matters. There are numerous other essential points discussed and expanded upon in my three-part book series. Open quote. Commentary to the Secret of La Salette. Close quote. Open quote. Commentary to the Secret of Fatima. Close quote. And open quote. Commentary on the Three Days of Darkness. Close quote. You can find the links to these books in the video description where free PDF files of the books are available for access. Next in order is a theological proof or demonstration that indicates an unexpected conclusion. The scripture suggests the vinegar given to Jesus Christ to drink during his crucifixion was miraculously turned to wine. I will present this demonstration as a sign that I was given a prophetic role, and part of the prophetic role in question has to do with explaining to people that the Diamond Brothers are the two witnesses of the Book of Revelation. So. If I manage to make a compelling or interesting demonstration, an honest person would feel challenged as far as asking themselves, is this really a sign that I'm brothers are the two witnesses of Revelation? To understand how vinegar during the crucifixion turned into wine, it's essential to explore the significant biblical connections in the gospel passage. By drawing parallels between various passages, we can uncover a deeper symbolic meaning suggested by the crucial moment in the crucifixion story. Let's explore the connections between various elements in the Gospels and the theme of consummation. In Matthew 24, 2, the prediction of the temple's destruction carries this theme of consummation. When Jesus refers to the destruction of the temple as akin to his body's destruction in John 2, 19, 
it further connects with the idea of consummation. The weariness Jesus feels while dealing with the money changers in the temple, as depicted in John chapter 2, verse 17, resonates with the Old Testament verse, open quote, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up, close quote. The link between the temple's destruction and Jesus' body experiencing suffering reflects the concept of consummation. This connection is reinforced by the etymological tie between to consume and to eat up in the word consummation in Latin. Moreover, the encounter with the money changers also relates to the temple's destruction and the idea of consummation. Christ's statement to the money changers that he would raise the temple in three days if it were destroyed further strengthens this association. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, Christ highlights the necessity of his baptism by John the Baptist for the, open quote, fulfillment of all righteousness, close quote. Aligning consummation with fulfillment, baptism becomes linked to consummation, symbolizing a death and subsequent renewal, as echoed in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. In Luke chapter 12, verse 50, in the context of the crucifixion, Jesus mentions a baptism he is destined to undergo, emphasizing its importance until it is, open quote, accomplished, close quote. This term accomplished in Greek is akin to consummated. Echoing his words on the cross in John 19.30, it is consummated. In summary, these gospel allusions to consummation suggest not only death, but also a profound renewal through a baptism-like experience, underlining a theme of spiritual rebirth and fulfillment. In the New Testament's first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 2, the evangelist appears to draw a distinction between the last hour marked by the emergence of many antichrists and the beginning where the teachings of the gospel start dwelling within disciples. This subtle implication suggests a connection between the hour of destruction and a renewed beginning of life, tying this contrast back to the idea of consummation. This comparison between the last hour and the beginning appears to align with the wedding at Cana, which introduces good wine at the end of the feast. So, if the contrast between the last hour and beginning relates to the wedding at Cana's wine changes and to the concept of consummation, one might draw a parallel between this and the crucifixion, where Jesus declares it is consummated, indicating a completion of his mission. In the wedding at Cana, Jesus tells Mary, open quote, my hour is not yet come, close quote, John 2, 4. And in the crucifixion, John 19, 27, also mentions the word hour. Furthermore, Jesus addresses Mary as woman in both the wedding at Cana, John 2, 4, and the crucifixion, John 19, 26. Also, the wedding at Cana refers to water pots used in Jewish purification rituals. John 2.6 And the crucifixion alludes to the use of hyssop, commonly linked to Jewish purification rites. John 19.29 With the parallel established between the wedding at Cana and the crucifixion, both connected to the concept of consummation, the miraculous transformation at the wedding, where good wine unexpectedly replaced bad, could mirror another potential miracle. Perhaps the sour vinegar offered to Jesus during the crucifixion might turn into good wine from the beginning, similar to the wedding at Cana's miracle of turning water into superior wine. As far as I'm aware, no one else in the history of Christianity has unraveled and connected these dots quite like this, leading to the unique conclusion that the vinegar offered during the crucifixion may have miraculously transformed into good wine. This powerful biblical demonstration is a divine sign that has been revealed to me to forewarn the faithful 
that the Diamond Brothers are the prophesied to witnesses of revelation, signaling the approaching time of their impactful three days of darkness intervention in the world. On May 14, 2022, while trying to pray, an unusual pressure hindered my prayers. Seeking help from various sources like the Virgin Mary or God directly didn't work. Unexpectedly, asking my guardian angel for intercession enabled me to pray continuously. During prayer, my guardian angel conveyed that a profound mystery was coming and instructed me to pray to avoid being unsettled when facing it. Later, I fell asleep and had a vivid dream. The dream displayed jungle-covered mountains with a robust and wide stature, having lakes and woods near their peaks. The Diamond Brothers ascended these mountains, aided by secure ropes, bringing along a few coreligionists and many animals. All reached the summit to console themselves with water from the summit lake. I tried ascending a rope, confident in its firmness. Suddenly, a stern voice from the Diamond Brothers declared that unauthorized climbers would be left to perish as they were strangers and deemed suspicious. However, Brother Michael Diamond unexpectedly administered water akin to baptism to me and another climber. The dream reflects that even with initial severity, forgiveness was granted based on sincere remorse for past mistakes. The Benedictine, Brother Michael Diamond, took on a compassionate appearance after reluctantly giving the water. This transformation parallels an earlier dream where sturdy angels suggestive of abundance and willingness to provide comfort appeared. The dream represents the ascent of the mountain as the approaching first day of darkness. It symbolizes a challenging time where the Rochester Benedictines possess and administer solace amidst divine severity meant for those genuinely repentant. The animals traveling with the Benedictines signify their zealous guarding of invaluable knowledge for the faithful. Those heeding this advice and seeking solace with sincere remorse will receive the necessary comfort to survive this challenging period. It's a compelling vision that brings clarity to a forthcoming spiritual challenge during the first day of darkness. The one meant to warn the faithful was inspired to take on the name Angel of the Bottomless Pit. He felt prompted to convey this message to the faithful. Listen to what the angel of the bottomless pit tells the Church of God if you wish to safeguard your soul during the first day of darkness.